So I'm going to introduce uh, Tara. So as many of you know, uh, Tara is a professor at the University of California, San Diego, where she's been for a number of years. Before that, she was briefly at the University of Washington at Seattle. She got her PhD at the University of Michigan. Um, she's won a number of awards, including the NSF Career Award, many conference paper awards. Um, I'll mention two consecutive Qualcomm faculty awards this year and last year. And she's been a distinguished lecturer of the Information Theory Society uh, the previous two years. And she's currently a uh, distinguished lecturer of the Communication Society. She sits on the Board of Governors of the IP Society. She's been an associate editor for the Transactional and Information Theory. That's ended, so you don't need to worry about your papers going to her, right? So that's, now she's an associate editor for Transactional and Communication. For Networking. Got that. I got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we're really excited to have her here, especially since this year uh, it turns out Tara is giving uh, tutorials at the European Information Theory School as well and the Australian Information Theory School. We're glad that Boston was able to, you know, be a sufficient draw. And I think this one week of weather, you know, it's all as you as for those of you who are locals, you know, some of my students who are here, you know, it's always like this year round. So. Right, this is the one nice week of weather we have for you the whole year, so that was a, a good reason to come to Boston. So we're very excited to have Tara here with us today to tell us about sequ sequential acquisition of information and you know, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Bobak. Um, yeah, actually, you. Um, even though this was not the last invitation I got, you will actually benefit from the feedback I got from the previous lectures. Um, so you can uh, talk to your friends in Europe and Australia and see if I got any better, uh, especially since I'm going to talk about sequential information acquisition. Hopefully, I know a little bit about interaction. So. Um, um, First of all, thanks to the organizers, especially Babak, uh, for being here. It's a great honor to be here. Um, on the interaction, so I'm going to uh, really count on you to give me feedback and interrupt and ask questions. Um, the talk that I have is on work that I've been doing for the past 10 years, so there's no way I could cover everything in every depth and with all details, so I'm going to count on you to ask me to zoom in, and hopefully when I talk about achievable strategies for uh, maximizing rate and reliability, you will learn that that's the best strategy in general to acquire information. So um, I have color-coded different parts because this is work of many, many students. Uh, I won't go, uh, mention all of them, but um, they have been critical in, you know, showing the results that I'm going to show you, I'm going to mention, uh -oh. I'm going to mention, ah, it doesn't have a pointer, does it? You know what, I have, oh, don't worry. Oh, I have, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to mention that the, the work I'm going to talk about on uh, interactive machine learning is with Kamalika Chaudhi and Farinas Kushampar, and the work on uh, measurement-dependent noise uh, is with uh, Yoni Kosti and Ofer Shaivitz. Uh, so uh, uh, Kamalika, Yoni, and Ofer all did their postdocs at UCSD, so um, a little bit of a plug for postdocs at UCSD. <laughs> okay. So um, let me just get started. Um, so if you think about the success of what we call data analytics, data science, machine learning, AI, I would say in the first generation uh, is due to the following model. So this is primarily the, you know, in, in my talk, I'm going to primarily talk about labeled data or supervised uh, machine learning or uh, analytics, but you can apply it in, in other um, domains. So the idea is you have some data and you would like to infer something about this data. The data is sitting there and you want to learn something about it and then you will use what you have learned on arbitrary instances. So you don't make assumptions about what is the specific 
instance of inference that you will see, or what is, uh, you know, what is the procedure of collecting this data? The data is collected, is there, maybe you clean it up a little bit, right? And as you start uh, looking at what is coming uh, our way as we sort of um, making progress in, uh, in machine learning, um, you see that in many practical scenarios, the data is not just collected and sitting there waiting for you to analyze it. You have control over analyze, uh, collecting the data itself, right? So it could be that your data is collected because you have a sensor to manage some sensing modality that you can change throughout the process. So you can maybe, uh, for example, if you're doing um, uh, tracking a person's activity, uh, you can decide to turn accelerometer on or maybe the GPS, depending on which one of those things are, uh, are unknown. And so the question is which one of those you want to turn on, why? Right? So that's what I call a runtime or test time or inference time. Uh, you could also have a data collection uh, decision to make. So uh, for example, a lot of people are interested these days to do the, to sort of repeat the success of image analysis, like classification, to medical imaging, right? So we all have seen, okay, computers can do magics with recognizing cats and dogs. Can they help us actually do diagnosis of, of say, benign tumors versus malignant ones, right? In these scenarios, labeling the data is a very expensive process because you have to go to a doctor and show them lots of bad examples. We know that in order for the cats and dogs to be distinguishable, you have to see examples of everything, right? And a doctor who has been trained, you know, you, you don't want to show them lots and lots of benign, uh, you know, get them to label lots and lots of benign uh, tumors, right? So the question of collecting the, that data and labeling it itself is a question of uh, you want to be judicious, right? So both of those scenarios, you would like to think about how do you actually acquire uh, the, the data, the original data, or maybe the runtime data. So in this talk, I'm going to try to convince uh, or communicate to you uh, what are the opportunities and the challenges. The problem, that, uh, the problem is way, way bigger than uh, one faculty at any university for 10 years to, to be able to finish it off. So think of this talk as more like, in, you know, sort of in, in, inspiring you to think about working in this area as uh, people who know information theory and are uh, picking up the tools. So uh, as I said, the one example that I'm going to come back to, the, uh, to this in this talk is the classification problem or parametric learning problem. So um, I'm going to go back and forth. Between. So the model is uh, that you have an input, let's say an image, uh, x, and a label y that they come together. And you would like to infer a parametric model of it. Like let's say you have some kind of a neural net with a given structure and you would like to find the best weight that explains your data. So this is a classification. Now if you are in the sense of active learning, uh, as we uh, talked about, you have control over with which x's to label, which images to show to the doctor for labeling as well as maybe there are different kind of labelers. You might have a medical school student who might make more errors. You can have the top of the line, uh, the you know, um, top of the food chain doctor who is well known for identifying a particular type of tumor. So the question is which one of these labeler you would even use, right? So you can sort of uh, think about this problem uh, in, in all sorts of variations. You can even, um, also think about, so you, instead of a parametric model, when I give you the model and I ask you find the parameters, you can even ask yourself, can I improve on the model itself? So for example, there is a lot of work, and if there's time, I'm going to talk about a little bit what we are doing there, uh, on how do you even tune the hyperparameters, how many layers you should pick in a neural network, for example, what kind of models you should even be looking for. So the interaction, you know, you take, the model you have learned, you go out there and uh, experiment with it, play it on, uh, in, in wild, see how good it is, you come back and change the model and go back and do it again. So these are all the 
acquiring information in the learning or training phase. You can do it, as I said, in the sensing uh, time or inference type. These are images that uh, my students have collected flying a drone. Again, at uh, some point in the talk, I'm going to talk about this drone platform. Um, basically looking at the same field uh, from different uh, elevations. So as you can see, depending just on the height of the drone, you get very different images, depend, uh, both in terms of quality and in terms of what area they cover. So the coverage area changes. So now if you're looking for this basketball in this court, you, in the run time, you're going to have a decision where to fly and where to look. Right? So that's when you do this problem, uh, you know, this collection of the data in the run. So these are the, the, the setups of the problems. In fact, these are the three, the, these are the three four problems that I, we have had success with, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about each of them, um, just to give you a flavor what the problems um, you know, resolve. So we, you're all familiar with information theory. So and a quick intuitive statement in information theory is information is equivalent to reducing uncertainty. Right? So in other words, at any given point, I should collect a sample that maximally reduces my uncertainty. Okay? But now, making this precise is exactly the, the challenge. Right? What notion of uncertainty? So many of you have seen the, the standard notion of uncertainty for information theorists, which is Shannon entropy. But you all know that just has an operational meaning for, for certain problems in information theory. So the real challenge often in these problems is to identify the right notion of uh, uncertainty. Okay? And especially for things that are time sensitive and so on and so forth. And then after you have done this, uh, what we do as information theorists are converses and achievability. Let me just say that in this talk, I'm not going to talk about converses, but all the results that we put up you know, has a converse that says you could not do better than something even if you were... Uh, you know, had more computational resource or you were smarter in terms of uh, algorithm, and hopefully those are not very off. Except for one location, when I'm gonna, when, uh, one slide when I'm going to talk about converses, I'm kind of ignoring converses in this talk. Achievability are basically algorithms that, that get us somewhere, right? And uh, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time about that. Okay, so I always tell my grad students uh, you get a problem, and what I really like about engineering students is that they just go at it. Like, solve it. Let's, let's solve it. Let's think about it. And often these problems are a little bit, um, you know, lack u uniqueness. The, the challenge of making inference on data goes back many, many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Human beings have been interested to look at patterns and make inference about how to explain it best. So the problems that I'm going to talk about actually go uh, back for a while. So I'm going to talk about the problem of basically information acquisition and talk about three uh, seminal work. I really hope, this is just a brief mention of these papers, I really, really hope that you get um, inspired to look at these papers. There's a lot um, you know, to look. So the problem actually generalizes seminal work of uh, four people. And three groups of uh, uh, results, uh, David Blackwell and Stein. Uh, by the way, these are all fantastic statisticians. Uh, I'm particularly very interested in David Blackwell's uh, um, legacy. He, you know, reading about his life as, as, uh, you know, has its own interest. You know, he's, uh, uh, he, could, he was not allowed to participate in uh, in advanced studies at Princeton because he was a black mathematician. He taught at Howard for a while before he got recruited to Berkeley. So he, as a person, he's a very interesting character, but his papers are also very fun to read. Um, and then uh, the work of uh, Herman Chernoff and, um, and also uh, the work of DeGroot. So let's talk about what these problems are. Roughly, and again, remember, the seminal examples are active machine learning or sensing with different sensing modalities. Okay, so they, and, and both of these problems fit in the setup that they propose. So the, the first two papers, uh, these are actually two papers, came out exactly at the same time, 1952. Uh, it was uh, a, uh, you know, separate paper by David Blackwell and Stein. 
And they looked at uh, a similar problem, but they were interested in a single shot experiment problem. So the problem is really simple. It says, let's say I have one experiment to run. Okay, medical experiment usually is, is what people had in mind. And I have impossible explanation, impossible or mutually exclusive hypotheses about what illness this patient has, okay? And I have some sort of observation model where if I run experiment A and uh, hypothesis I is correct, I will see a statistical outcome according to a distribution QI of A. Right? Is the setup clear? So they ask this question, if I have two experiments, A and A prime, is there a way for me to say which one is better to test? Okay? And it turns out that they only could solve, so their paper could only solve the following uh, kind of intuitive uh, reasoning. If you can take two experiments, A and A prime, and look at these uh, observation kernels QIA for both of them. If one is stochastically degraded version of the other one, so in other words, you can think of, let's say, the, the QIA prime as QIA passing through a channel, right? Then A prime is not as informative as A. So they showed this. They said you can throw away this. Of course, this is never the case. Right? <laughs> Human beings have built experiments that are not as bad as a stochastically degraded version of another experiment. If you do that, you throw away the previous experiment and say this was not good. So in some ways, their answer is mathematically precise, but, but it was not uh, uh, sort of uh, illuminating in terms of algorithm. However, the reason I would like to talk about this paper is that it nailed down what is the guts of the problem, the, the difficult problem. So if you think about it, actually, in fact, David Blackwell is a well-known uh, Bayesian, and, and in fact, this, this uh, view of the problem is a Bayesian view of the problem. So you can sort of think about putting a prior on your hypotheses which is equivalent, a fancy way of saying, let's say hypothesis I is correct with probability rho I, okay? If I do that, I can, you know, build the, the distribution of the observations or the output, right? So I say if I run experiment A, the output will be a mixture distribution, right? Rho I is the probability that I is correct QI of A is the observation distribution under that hypothesis, and if you sum them up, you will get the output distribution, right? Now, output, I would see, let's play the fictitious, this fictitious game in our head, that I might see an output Z of A. This will be a random variable, but let's say for a minute I will fix it. If I know what output I have seen, I would write the Bayes rule and can reevaluate the prior into a posterior, right? So the prior is a le m length vector, and now I have to pass it through this Bayes operator, nonlinear operator. You all know how it works from your high, uh, from hopefully from your undergrad. So this is the posterior is just nothing but reevaluation of that. Now, remember my observations have not happened yet. Right? So this will be a random operation, depending on what observations I will see. So you can sort of think about this as a dynamical system. I start with a vector rho, and it will go to rho t plus ones according to what kind of observations you would see, and you have the distribution of those observations. Right? So it is like when you're actually gamble. When you play, you will actually making these calculations. When you're playing poker or when you're going to the, you know, to the casino, you just ha always have a sense of what's going to happen and you're betting your. So the questions that basically Stein and, and Blackwell answered is that this operation under the model of stochastic, uh, stochastic degradation will always be in a stochastic sense the vector that you will see it will be random, but those are all going to be ordered, right? Because it's a stochastic order, ordering relation. 
Okay, but I'm going to come back to this geometry a lot. This is, this is the, the real hard problem is how do you start from a prior and where do you basically uh, send it? Now, uh, Chernoff looked at the same exact problem but in the complete opposite asymptotic regime. So, Blackwell and Stein, they talked about one experiment. Uh, basically, um, Chernoff's model is an asymptotically large number of experiments. So he said, what if I collect samples in time and make a decision after I have enough evidence to tell me which one of these hypotheses is correct? Can I tell myself, can I you know, calculate how this uh, error will behave? Right? So the error is if I make a mistake in terms of determining the correct hypothesis or not. So if you, and a very, very common assumption is you put a prior which is a uniform prior. You assume you know nothing about them and you basically follow through, right? So you basically now have the same setup as Blackwell and Stein, but now you're moving it in time, right? So it's like a stochastic dynamical system. And he wanted to, uh, to understand this and he showed uh, the following results, that if you send the number of samples to infinity, um, you can basically, you will have a lot of samples to, and, and in fact, turn off model, he only had two hypotheses. His uh, students extended it to M, pretty much the same for a fixed M. And it boils down at the end of the day is that you're gonna collect a lot of noise, right? Uh, but noise will average out, the truth will not, right? So I and J will be discriminated against each other and he calculated what is that rate of convergence, right? So it's not surprising for all. I hope everybody in this room, you have one bit of information, whether hypothesis zero is correct or one, null hypothesis or the alternative, you have one bit of information and I'm giving you lots and lots of channel use. So of course you will be able to tell me what the bit is and the error probability you can calculate and, and I'll talk about this, okay? And he calculated what is the largest negative exponent. Any questions? Okay. The last uh, paper that I would like to point out is uh, basically in 1963, 10 years later, uh, and it's uh, by another statistician, um, Dick Root. And he basically, and the reason I like this is because he sort of looked at the same problem, exactly the same problem as Chernoff, non-asymptotic though, just that asymptotic. And he thought, okay, I have these vectors, length m, and I have to keep track of these stochastic jumps, right? Depending on what observations I see, I have to like do this stochastic analysis. And normally when people do stochastic analysis on high dimensions, a very popular method is to, instead of work with the vectors themselves, work with the energy or potential or a scalar version of them, right? So he said, ah, here, what is that the scalar of interest is some notion of uncertainty associated with this vector. Remember the vector was the prior or the posterior. It was a distribution on which hypothesis is correct with what probability, right? So I can measure an uncertainty associated with that. That will be a number. And now I can do better than just comparing these random vectors because now I can compare the uncertainty at the prior with the expected uncertainty at the posterior. That's a way of averaging things, right? And he basically said, let's define a notion of information utility as the reduction in the notion of uncertainty that will happen going from, a, uh, from prior to posterior. And now under every experiment, I can measure this quantity, this quantity, and he characterized for V being concave and so on and so forth, this quantity will always be non-negative. And now he said, oh, a good heuristic, this is a, uh, you know, an algorithm, would be to pick an experiment or action, depending on the literature, the names change, that maximizes this reduction in uncertainty. Okay, or maximizes information utility. And not surprising in his work, he looked at entropy. 
right? He suggested the entropy and the difference will be mutual information, right? It's, uh, you know, I would say maybe he was looking at Shannon's work and say, oh, maybe I can solve this problem. Now, we were looking at these literature uh, back in 2010, and we, uh, one important question that came up is that which intuition should we use? These people have solved the problem many years ago. For problems that are small, I can calculate the quantities that they have asked, and I can calculate the actions associated with that. What will be the right policy? And it turned out we would get contradictory recommendations. So remember, I said De Groot said, ah, notion of uncertainty is your choice. In fact, I should say, uh, I should pause. The problem of uh, if, if M is fixed, if everything is actually non-asymptotic, the problem also can be solved thinking of it as a palm DP. And he characterized that the optimal notion of uncertainty is the solution to a fixed point equation given by palm DP, which computationally is impossible to solve, but at least he characterized it. And then he suggested uh, Shannon entropy as a good proxy. And if you do that, if you listen to him, these are the actions that maximize mutual information at the beginning when I know nothing. Okay? It's, it's easy to write examples where, uh, and work out the you know, maximizing mutual information. This is what Chernoff will solve. Chernoff would say, pick the location that is likely to have the ball and try to discriminate it the fastest, the most reliable way. And that would mean that you will fly the drone really low and you will scan the whole graph, right? So that was the intuition that got us uh, sort of started on this track. We were like, okay, these people have worked on this, but they are giving us very different suggestions at what the solution should be like. Now, in practice, practitioners use this, and almost all statistics literature is about getting better and better exponents or characterizations of these solutions, okay? So that's, that's sort of where we started. So I'm going to, um, let me make sure my timing is OK. Uh, good. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take a minute, maybe uh, uh, briefly, to just tell you something generic about active hypothesis testing um, and then move on uh, and give you specifics. Um, so the first component that, uh, that we could uh, sort of um, extend well, it came out of this contradiction between Chernoff and, uh, and uh, uh, De Groot's suggestions. Um, so one thing we noticed um, that you have three performance measures in, in this problem. You can ask yourself how many hypotheses I have to disam disambiguate, that's M. Because the world is noisy and we live in a Shannon theoretic view of the problem, I say, okay, I might not be able to make a decision with full certainty, so I'm going to be happy with some target error probability. This is if I give you an answer with this error, you'll be happy, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6, whatever that your design parameter. And we notice that both of these are using the, the samples to, to improve upon. Right? So let's say I have n samples, and this n samples could be truly n fixed samples or on average n samples, okay? And um, you can sort of ask yourself, is there a hope that I can send error probability to zero exponentially fast? The more samples you give me, the better and better my reliability will be. Or you can do the sort of rate uh, trick and say the more samples I have, the more I should be able to handle in terms of hypotheses. In fact, I can think about a rate with which the hypotheses grow relative to the number of samples, right? So if you give me 10 samples, I, and if it was noisy, uh, I'm sorry, noiseless, you would be able to tell me after 10 binary samples, 2 to the 10 possibilities, right? So the goal is to get a 2 to the nr scaling, okay? So um, many people in the style literature had not noticed this question because Chernoff had said m is fixed, 
let's look at how error exponent dies with samples. And we, we saw, no, actually, if you look at, for example, even this problem of uh, finding the basketball in this court, there, is, there are many different kind of questions you can answer. If I tell you to just tell me which quadrant the ball is, most of your time, you're going to be refining your decision by taking different measurements of that one quadrant, right? Because that's four, four quadrants. You don't have a whole lot to resolve. But if I tell you with better resolution, tell me the location, now the new samples you're taking can be used to decide whether it's in this quadrant or whether it's in some subset of it, right? So in other words, if you use your measurements to identify or disambiguate larger number of hypotheses, there is very uh, little hope that you can also use it for making your decisions reliable, okay? And that's exactly what we showed. We showed that these two quantities are actually are in trade-off. So let's, let's try to understand them a little bit more. So if you fix M and just look at error probability, how it can, dies out, I take, and let's say I only have M equal to two. Everything else will boil down to this two. Um, what do I see? I see random observations that come from null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis, right? And if I take many, many samples, I can build these histograms or these distributions. And now it becomes a question of how distinguishable these two distributions are, or what is the distance between them. In fact, mathematically, you can show that error probability goes down exponentially fast with the KL divergence between these two things. So, and that is what Chernoff is really showing, right? So it's maximizing this uh, reliability. This is the regime that, uh, that w at least in the active hypothesis testing literature, was uh, ignored. And this is the regime that you either have many, many hypotheses or you have very small samples. It's the dual of each other. So this is the example. Let's say I have a bunch of pluses and minuses. This is the active learning setup. And I want to find the best linear separator that can explain my data. And I'm in this active domain where I'm going to ask myself, um, among these uncountably many explanations, which ones are going to be the best one? And the way to do it is to collect more samples, right? So now I have an option to collect a sample maybe here and ask for its label, or here and ask, ask for its label, right? And the question is, which one of these are better? And the answer is, whichever actually faster throws away a bunch of these explanations, right? If it was noiseless, it would just be a question of percentage of these lines that will get eliminated with the answer that I will learn, right? And so, and this, when it's noisy, it's nothing but the mutual information, right? So when it's noiseless, it's just the percentages. You can do combinatorial arguments. When it's noisy, you have to uh, account for it with uh, mutual information. In fact, we showed that indeed there exists a trade-off between this exponent E and this exponent R. So this is a reliability rate trade-off that for any active hypothesis testing problem, doesn't matter what it is, which one of those two problems, you will have this trade-off. And the trade-off is roughly like this. So this is the only time I said I'm going to talk about converse. So the red line shows our converse. It says no matter what, no matter how the solution is, there exists some notion of maximal information, mutual information, and a maximal exponent. And there is a line that connects them. No test. No possible way of collecting the samples can do better than this trade-off, okay? This is the achievability, and I'm gonna talk about this algorithm uh, a lot in, this, uh, in the remainder of the talk. This is the achievability. We achieved some non-zero rate for all active hypothesis testing problems. Uh, the mutual information we could construct, our algorithm could achieve, and the exponent. And again, we showed that this algorithm also has a linear trade-off between rate reliability, right? In other words, you cannot reduce both of them at the same time. Unfortunately, this is not a tight analysis in the sense that there is a strict gap between our outer bound and our achievability. 
right? In fact, Chernoff solution, the zero rate, because Chernoff kept M fixed and just sent the exponent to, uh, to zero exponentially fast. So that would be equivalent of a zero rate analysis, right? You were just repeating uh, an experiment. That quantity strictly lied between the two lines that we identified. And, um, and basically, uh, we wanted to find examples where this is actually tight. And so the, the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you examples when this bound is tight, and I will talk about the achievability of this. Is there any question on this like very big, like 10,000 view overview of the problem? No? Okay. Okay, so I, fortunately I got lots of good questions about uh, what I'm gonna talk about, which is the one example where these converse and the achievability are tight. And this is the problem, uh, we call it measurement dependent noisy search. The problem really was motivated with the UAV search that I uh, showed you. So this is our, my apologies. This is our, uh, the, uh, basically uh, the field of view of our drones. These are drones, we buy them less, around $150, and uh, they have a fixed camera. It's the, the camera is not very high quality. So if you fly up, because of the field of view and the way it's structured, you will cover more area, right? But the quality of the images are much worse than the quality of the image if you fly low. And what we do is on, this, uh, on these uh, drones, we basically use some state-of-the-art computer vision-based classifier that says, that's been trained to say yes or no, whether there's a ball in there or not. And it makes a lot more errors if you're showing it this kind of images, right? So in, in other words, the measurement noise depends on your action. That's why I call it a me measurement dependent noise, right? A similar problem, and I'm gonna show you results also uh, in this, happens when you're trying to align millimeter wave uh, communication beams. So in uh, beam alignment for millimeter wave, you basically, these are massive MIMO transmitters and receivers. Because you have many antennas, you have the ability to build pencil sharp uh, basically beams, and that means you don't, you can, in, uh, you don't have to deal with interference, you can go very high, you can defeat path loss, and so on and so forth. But the challenge from the networking perspective is the transmitter and receivers have to exactly know their location to be able to line up their beams if they're line of sight. If they're not line of sight, they have to basically find the best scatterer that they can lock into, right? So the two problems are similar in what sense? If I widen my beam, I can hear many, many directions, but the noise will be a lot worse because I'm collecting noise from all angles. In fact, the, uh, when I talk about the practical implementation, I'll show you that this is done in a 120 degree uh, sector, like you have 120 degree that you are looking for a transmitter that is transmitting at the beam angle of one degree. So you have 120 degrees and you would like to find which degree is the transmitter signal arrives. And then we have some models and, and I'll talk about this in more details. But basically these two problems are inherently the same problem, okay? So let's look at the math problem, okay? So this is information theory school. So I have to do a little bit information theory, right? A little bit of a math. So the, the problem is, very, the, is, is fairly simple to describe. So let's say I'm looking for an unknown parameter that sits in an interval size, so I have flattened the geometry, just make, make it simple. So I have an interval length B, and I'm looking for an object within a resolution of delta. So you can sort of think about, I take B divided by bins of size delta, so I have B over delta location, and I'm asking you myself to find the location of the parameter within this resolution, within uh, giving me the index of the bin of, uh, that contains the parameter. 
Now, my decisions, my actions, are which bins I inspect at the same time, right? And so I can sort of think about a decision vector, I'm gonna represent it with the same length B over delta, and every bin that I decide to include in my inspection, I put a one there, right? So that's uh, A, that's my action A. And now my noisy observation has the following structure. It's the inner product of my action vector with my unknown vector theta, right? So in other words, if my action, if I put a one in the bin that has the target, the two, bin, the two ones will coincide, I will get a one, otherwise I get a zero, right? So the first element, this, this first element is either zero or one, depending on whether the intersection of these two vectors is, uh, the intersection of the support uh, is empty or not, plus a noise, and I'm gonna assume this noise, uh, the variance of this noise increases with the more ones I put in my vector, right? So in other words, if I search a larger area, my noise is larger. A very standard, and this is all the numerical results that I show you, even though the theory will hold for everything in general, all the numerical results I'll show you has the following model that the noise, Z of A, is really nothing but sum of uncorrelated Gaussians in the number of bins that you have searched, right? So that means if it's their uncorrelated Gaussian, that means the variance increases linearly with the number of ones in your vector A, right? So in other words, your decision on how many ones you have here affects the variance of this. And as I said, on all of the numerical examples, I'm gonna assume this is a Gaussian whose variance is growing linearly with it. So again, this problem, word by word, is a special case of Chernoff setup, right? At every time t, let's say time one, I inspect some set of bins, a of one, and I collect the measurement y1, and then I go back and look at y1, depending on y1, I decide orchestrate a2, and so on and so forth. I go up to some time tau, this could be a fixed time or it could be a stopping time, some criterion, at which point you look at all of your observations, all of the actions you took, and you decide what is the most likely, you know, the, uh, the bin that contained your data, uh, your parameter, and then if you make a mistake, you pay a penalty in form of error, okay? So is the setup clear? So this is, this is the active hypothesis test. So what we showed were two important things. The first one was basically to characterize what is the benefit of searching larger areas, okay? So in, in this for the purposes of uh, flying the drone, it was kind of clear to people that if you fly higher, you will cover more area. But the noise, again, remember, is getting worse. So people would argue, you're flying higher, you think you are covering more area, but it's noisier. So be careful, you will have to repeat, right? So maybe it's not worth it. Especially in the millimeter wave alignment, many people will come up to me and say, ah, you widen the beam, the SNR drops like crazy, you will get junk, it's useless, don't do that. Right? And what we showed in our theoretical results was that basically in the noiseless, uh, in the noiseless setting, what you gain from multi-elevation flight is a logarithmic growth in the area in terms of the sample complexity, right? Or in terms of how much flight time I have. If I can cover different points in this decision tree, the depth of my decision tree is only log m, right? versus if I was flying according to Chernoff, which would be M, right? So we said, okay, this is uh, the, the noiseless setup. We showed that you can get similar scaling even with the noisy setting that I just showed you. So even in the noisy, uh, noisy setting, the same result holds. Uh, a second question, and uh, a couple of you asked me this question during the, during the talk, uh, during the, the break. Um, if I say I'm gonna actively search, it means I collect an observation 
update my posterior, collect the next observation. Or you can sort of think about it, I have to remember everything I have seen. Either I do a lot of computation in terms of Bayes' rule, or I have to remember a longer and longer sequence of past events. And that complexity-wise is expensive. So if you go to an engineer and say, I'll give you a solution that requires this complexity, you better tell them what they will gain compared to a random strategy that you will get from, let's say, a random code type of strategy that is like basically randomly searched. Right? And in fact, this is what we showed. We showed because the noise actually modulates with the, re, uh, with the region that you're searching, there is a non-zero gap. So here I'm showing you the expected number of samples to get to a reliability epsilon as a function of the noise per one bin. Right? The one bin, if I know exactly to look at, the, would, the signal would be one, and the variance would be the variance of that bin, the uncorrelated noise. This is what it's showing. The red is the, the non-adaptive strategy outer bound. So you could do an information theoretic argument and get an outer bound. The green is an algorithm we came up with, and we, sh we characterize what is the gain that you would get. So this is a theoretical guaranteed gain. And as you can see, it really very much depends on SNR. If SNR is low, this gap is non-zero. If the SNR grows, this gap goes to zero. Can anybody tell me intuitively why you would expect that if SNR gets large, that the gap goes to zero? Did anybody expect that? In the noiseless setting, if SNR is for sure, okay. This is not any algorithm. This is one algorithm, which is our active, adaptive version. I haven't told you. But the other one is a constrained one, is a one that is not adaptive, right? It's the best non adaptive. And I'm arguing that the best non adaptive strategy will do as well as adaptive strategy. Oh, that's, a, that's a good point. If I, if I, had, yeah, if I had infinitely uh, one noise, but, but then I still, uh, my computer vision one says zero or one. So if you go super high up and cover everything, it's true. But let's say you cannot cover the full re region, and that's actually true for most of our thing. There is a maximum high. So at least you want to cover half of the space, no more than the half. But, but you're getting close. So if I was give, forcing you, if, so he's saying if I go really up, looking up, I'm not taking binary measurement. I'm not saying yes or no. I'm getting the full vector of measurements, right? I exactly tell you what the balls is in exact location. That is like a measurement that is really high dimensional, right? Even if, but my question is, if I was forced to tell you yes or no answers, you still could do as well as a non-adaptive strategy. What is the strategy? So first of all, what is the no noiseless uh, solution you would give for that problem? So you're, you're basically searching for an object, and you get yes or no in the groups. Bisection, right, or binary search, depending on the language. You would take half, say, uh, is this target here or not? here or not, here or not, and you would just go down, right? So in that setting, uh, you will get the performance is log m, right? And then you will get it. But this curve says I have a non-adaptive strategy that does just as well. Can anybody tell me what that non-adaptive strategy would be? We are in information theory school, so what is a good code if you were not worried about decoding complexity? Uh huh. So in fact, if I take any subset of size half and I just randomly pick any such set 
and I will just ask this question, is it here, is it here? With log m of them, I get a unique intersection, and that unique intersection will tell me where the location of the ball is. Right? Is that clear? Right? So, it's not surprising for high SNR, the difference will go to zero. So now, what else would you expect to see um, from, from this connection to random code? So the criticality of this noise, uh, this measurement dependent noise, right? If measurement dependence goes less than linear, this gap should get smaller and smaller. And if it goes more than linear, this gap gets larger and larger. And this is what this guy is showing. So this one is super linear. It grows as uh, size of the search region to the power 1.5. And this is when, I'm oh, sorry, this is uh, when the, the, it doesn't, this is a sublinear growth. So it grows as square root. When it goes completely flat, so the noise becomes independent of the size, what do you expect? The gap to go zero, why? One is because the pattern tells me, but from your information theory, Okay, so it seems like it's not clear, so I'll, I'll hold on to it. And we'll, when, we, when I show you the analysis, we will see why the gap will go to zero if the size, of the, if the size was not affecting the noise, okay? So, plus, and, and that's this analysis. So the main, main observation is the following. If you look at my observation vector, it was the support of my inspection vector and the support of my very super sparse uh, target vector, right? And somebody was asking me if there's a connection to sparse recovery and that there is, and this is, this is the connection, but I'm, I'm more focused on the noise effect, okay? But so you're looking for this guy, it's so zero or one plus some noise. Now, this is the simplest channel you could think of, simplest practical channel, binary input channel. Now, I said we're going to assume Gaussian for the purpose of this talk. If this is a Gaussian noise, this is a binary input additive Gaussian channel, right? This is telling you no matter how bad this noise is, this channel has a non-zero capacity, which means that the number of samples are going to, sorry, the number of samples is going to grow as log of V over delta, which is your uh, number of messages, times epsilon divided by the mutual information that you can get from this channel. Right? So no matter what ZA is, some Gaussian with some variance, you can calculate the mutual information, and that will be the number, roughly the number of measurements you would get. But more importantly is the figure that I have shown you that connects my search problem to a channel coding problem. So here I am, run, uh, I am writing down the, num the location of the target as one over, one up to B over delta I should have written, but because I want to make an information theory sounding, I'm going to say one to M, okay? These are the locations, this is my message, becomes my message. And the, the columns are basically my measurements. So if I put a one in column two's first component and second component, that means I have searched these two guys, okay, at time two, right? And now my measurement was, will be, of course, the intersection of every time I put a one in this second column where the target is. Right? That would be the noiseless measurement. Right? Everybody sees that? And then I add a noise to it, a Gaussian noise. The only weird thing about the, my channel coding problem is that my noise is affected by the column of my, uh, of my search. Right? So in other words, you can sort of think about this as a code book. Right? For every location, I'm giving you the code, right? If, if location two is there, you will see one, one, zero, something, one, right? If the target is in location one, you will see zero, one, zero, blah, 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 if it was noiseless, right? And now I add some noise to it. Is that clear? Right. Now can you tell me why if, the, if this arrow was not there or the noise was independent of the, of the measurement, 
the gap between non-adaptive strategy and adaptive strategy would be zero. Can anybody tell me now? What would an adaptive strategy do? Absolutely. So the idea, so the idea is, and I'm going to jump a little bit ahead, come back to this. The idea of active or adaptive solution is you will depend on YN to choose the column, right? But we know without this arrow, channels without memory using feedback does not increase the capacity, right? This is the well-known results due to Shannon it's himself, right? So in other words, if the noise was not modulated by my signal, by my measurement, I was not expecting to get a whole asymptotic gain from going from adaptive to non-adaptive. So yes, one of you said maybe there will be a non-adaptive uh, uh, um, loss, but it will be in constants, not in the scaling, not in the rate. Okay, so let me go back a second. Yes. You will get, so in, in our setup, the, the, the results are very still small, but it will be a gap. It, it might be a gap, but it's not anything worth your time in terms of design. You remember, the computations are expensive. You're doing a quadratic uh, compu computation, sometimes even polynomial up to four to just do the Bayes rule. Okay, so it's not worth it. Um, Ah, so this was the case, so you have a binary input and you have a, a noise model and you basically want to maximize, uh, you want to solve it. So we know that I'll have to do, I have to focus on this mutual information. So what do I do? A random code will put some number of ones in each column. Right? That will determine what is the distribution of this x of a, right? If I put q1s and there will be q times m1 possibilities, right? The probability of a 1 will be exactly q, right? So that will be the distribution of this guy. And then you will calculate yi, the mutual information between xa and ya, right? And now you can basically... Uh, you, you can basically, this is nothing but the capacity of a, the capacity of a binary input, additive Gaussian channel, where it has this weird input distribution. The input distribution is Q, and the noise is now Q, square root of Q, the, the variance is going to grow linearly with Q, the, the, the standard deviation square root of Q times B times sigma. Sigma is the bin, the noise per bin. Right? So now you can go and optimize what is the best Q star, and that will give you the capacity, how it, this capacity will scale. So now this is, even though it's an asymptotic analysis, you can now play with these numbers and get the maximum C. Um, so, so we could do that, and for different problems you can calculate this. This is the number of locations B over delta. This is the capacity, this guy that I put up. This is if you fix delta and vary, sorry, this is if you fix B and vary delta. This is if you uh, uh, basically fix delta and vary B, right? So this, this you can find the best that you can do, okay? So this is the non-adaptive strategies. And this, uh, this is a, you know, a strong converse. So if you do anything, you know, if you want anything more than this, non-adaptive strategies cannot give you. So those are the red lines in my curves, right? So this is a very generous, you will see, a very generous outer bound for non-adaptive strategies. Now, what about adaptive strategies? So the adaptive strategy we have, and I think this is, a, this is a worth uh, mentioning, this is the right time. This is the, the strategy that I can show that achieves the optimal rate reliability curve that, that I showed you before, works like this. It basically, ah, oi, this dude didn't show up. <laughs> So the candidate algorithms, the ones that many people were referring to uh, that is not good. So of course the first algorithm, the first algorithm is a repeated linear search. What do I mean by that? You pick a location and you 
tested, right? And then you look at another location and test it to get to the reliability epsilon and go through. The scaling for the repeated linear search is B over delta times log of epsilon. So you can see this is a very bad algorithm if you have any large B over delta. But this is the Chernoff optimal solution, by the way. This is, a, this is saying repetition codes are bad. Right? That's all it is, right? Repetition codes here are also very bad. And the denominator is the KL divergence. This is the KL divergence between signal plus noise and noise, right? So that's, that's what you get there. I'm sorry for the repeated binary search. So this, was, uh, this is what people do as soon as they get a binary search type problem. Because we know how to solve the noiseless problem. So you search for half or bisection. You search for half, and then now I have noise. So a lot of people suggest that you hear this and you will repeat it up to you get better than epsilon, maybe epsilon to the n, and then you repeat the half up to epsilon, and then you go on. So because there is log n of them, epsilon times log n is epsilon, and that's it, right? Is that clear? So the scaling there will be log of b over delta times log of epsilon. Uh, maybe so was, yeah, so I apologize. There's no uh, pen, so it would be log of b over epsilon, uh, b over delta times log of epsilon. Still a zero rate, because if you want better and better epsilon, you will basically have to repeat more and more and more, right? So it doesn't actually scale well um, in terms of rate. And I will show you numerically that it doesn't either, okay? So we would like to get this sort of behavior, log of B over F, uh, delta plus and minus log of epsilon. That's the, that's the kind of performance you would get. So this is, uh, builds on an algorithm uh, that uh, was well known in the literature. It's the, the very original one. The one I'm going to present here goes to Hornstein. Um, but the variant of it, the more generic uh, name for it for a general channel is known as posterior matching. And it was analyzed very carefully by uh, Ofer Shaivitz uh, before joining UCSD. So this work uh, that I'm going to talk about is, is uh, joint work with Ofer and Giannis and Caspi. So this basically, this algorithm ensures that you have a very large um, mutual information along the way. Not only one instance, but along the way. And it works as, uh, as this. So the idea of posterior matching is simple. You take the location, so there you have B over delta location, and you put a prior on it. At the beginning, this prior will be all uniform, but as you collect information, there will be some bins that are more likely to hold the target and some bins that are less, right? So the idea of posterior matching is exactly like bisection search, but on this posterior. So bisection search will divide it, uh, the area that you're searching into equal size sets. Now, in posterior matching, you will take two equal in a probabilistic sense sets, which means you can find the median of this guy and search left of the median, okay? So that's the posterior matching. Now the problem is if the target is close to the beginning, for us this is good because left of the median becomes a small set. If it's the other end, it will be bad, right? So what we do is we do first a sorting. You sort the posterior from the large probability to the small probability, and now we do the median, search the left of the median of the sorted posterior. Is that clear? So now you do this algorithm, and it turns out, so here, just to give you a sense, so this was my sorted posterior, this is my median, I will basically search the three bins to the left, and don't search the, to the right. The middle guy, we have to do some randomization. I don't have time to go get into the detail, details, but you can, you can play the trick. So you do this analysis, and you quickly, for our algorithm, show that no matter how the noise scales, so long as you're careful, you can ensure that even when the noise is growing super linearly with, with the size and such, you are benefiting from larger searches. So in fact, as I said, for flight, people were not skeptical, uh, but for uh, 
millimeter wave if you go to an RF designer and say I want a massive MIMO in the 60 gigahertz but please give me a very wide beam they're like you're insane I'm going to give you a very narrow beam with no side lobe like that's the art right so you said tell them oh I want a fat beam they're like oh your SNR is going to be too bad why would you want it and so our, our research shows there is a lot of gain and that's the group testing gain that, that you would get the second thing is this characterization of the feedback gain I showed you the upper bounds and the lower bounds but really uh, theoretically we can characterize this quantity and it required some some work okay so of course this was just in the theory so just to show you that there is a benefit in being theoretician these days um, my students come to me and they're always very practical minded and they ask me do you think your theory is useful and I'm so sure I always tell them yes it will be even when I have no idea and in fact for the drone problem this is a student of mine who is a very practical person uh, he's uh, he's now considering joining really practical computer vision groups and he came to me and said I want to do computer vision I am a practitioner I don't want to prove theory do you think your theory is useful and it was a very bad mistake for me to say yes to him but it was really fun as you will see because the, the theory needs a lot of tweaking okay and this is a quote uh, that has been attributed to a wide variety of people if anybody knows the real source please talk to me after the talk uh, the ones I know is, includes Yogi the bear all the way to Einstein and I have not been able to pinpoint it so this is uh, the, uh, I'm going to first show you the alignment problem. So remember, this is the millimeter wave scenario. I have massive MIMO, and I would like to find the transmitter is transmitting one, one degree, knows where the base station is roughly, so it just uh, transmits towards the base station. And now the base station at the receiver has to find the angle of arrival. Now, here, the problem is not as easy as I posed it in the sense that there is no binning of the angle of arrival. The angle of arrival translates to basically the manifold of the, the, the beam shape that arrives at the, at the receiver, which will look like something like this. So the angle of arrival appears in this uh, frontier of the, of the beam. And the receiver, so this is, uh, these receivers are limited. So the receiver will have one RF chain often in these uh, scenarios, which means that it will basically collect signals, uh, complex uh, signals at these, uh, at these uh, antennas. But basically, because there's only one RF chain, it sums them up, gets rid of all the phase and everything, and you get a one scalar. Uh, could be complex, but one number at the end of uh, at the end of the process. Often, this is actually a real number, and there is some formula for it. And this is called also, by the way, analog beam forming. And it translates so the search problem instead of ones. Now I can't really put ones anywhere, but you can sort of think about it. The weight that you put on the antenna components reception, they receive something, you can weigh them or uh, basically degrade them and then look at the sum of those. So those weights are my, they're equivalent to my measurements and they affect both the signal as well as the noise, right? So in that sense, it is a measurement dependent um, uh, noisy. Uh, problem and then you will basically have this adaptive structure that controls the weight the analog uh, beam forming weight WT now I said yeah uh, it, it, you could you could play so actually the competition with all the solutions that I put up are sparse solutions Right, like people try to recover the sparse vector that they can construct. In some space, it is sparse, right? Because it's only a one degree. In some domain, it's sparse. So people bring it back here and use the sparse recovery to construct the solution. Exactly, there will be a connection to group testing. But now there's a lot more geometry. So when you do sparse recovery and so on, you're using the geometry of this vector, right? And, and I'm not, I'm ignoring that. But that's a great question. But that, those are our competition, and I'll show you how they perform. But they, remember, the sparse solutions are all going to be non-adaptive, just because that's where that literature is uh, most powerful. Um, 
so this, the, the group testing is, is ours. Group testing is the simple one. It's just put ones and zeros, right? In that case, it's, it's, it's the same idea as that we had to. Okay, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so I was saying the theory is different from practice, so these are the, the two things that are different. In the analog, uh, in the, sorry, in the beam pattern, you're not only affected by the angle of arrival, but you're also affected by the fading coefficient of the channel. So the channel affects your signal, and this fading coefficient is not known in advance. So when, when, when I want to find a transmitter, I don't know the fading coefficient. So this is not known. The second thing is, remember, I did this weird sorted posterior match, which basically meant I put ones anywhere in my vector that I wanted. In reality, if you're designing these antennas, you cannot put any weight that you like. So in fact, the WTs are not arbitrary. There's some constraints about what the WTs are, right? In, in particular, we were interested in using these hierarch hierarchical beam patterns that were developed by Robert Heath's group uh, in, uh, in Austin, where they basically have designed these sort of beams. If you look at the beam, the beam is not zeros and ones in angles. As you can see, it's almost like ones and then flat down, but like there's side lobes, there's non-idealities in the middle, right? So the, the shape of WT is, is like this, and as, as you make it narrower and narrower, there's the more weirder non-ideal effects about this beam pattern, right? So we wanted to do this uh, for this. In fact, Robert Heath's group, they used this hierarchical beam pattern, and they did a repeated binary search, and I'm going to show you the results of what they, they found in terms of uh, performance. So these are the two things. So we, we went ahead and basically did the same thing. Now, something really interesting happened. So now I have to do posterior matching subject to this constraint. So equivalent, I don't have time to go through, if, uh, through the details very carefully here. If you're interested, I can talk to you after uh, the talk. But just to give you a flavor, this is going to be a posterior matching on a tree. What do I mean by that? Remember, I want some answer, the probability that was closer to a half, right? In posterior matching, we said, give me the subset or the bins that if I add them together, they will be closest to the half, right? Here, I'm going to do on the tree, go to the deeper uh, node in the tree that has a probability close to a half. That would be the posterior matching. We call it a hierarchical posterior matching. And you do this. And this is the kind of analysis that you, this is now just really, uh, you know, simulate the hell out of the problem and, and measure the performance. Again, this is the raw SNR. This is the raw SNR at a particular distance. So this, uh, you know, basically for these problems, this is the SNR. Uh, when this is uh, known as the full beam uh, gain. So if I knew exactly where the transmitter is and I was listening to them with the perfect W that was matched, that's the SNR that I would get. So this is that SNR. This is the best SNR I could get. Uh, the blue is what Al Khatib uh, et al. was. This is Robert Heath's group. They are doing repeated binary search, right? And this is how they were scaling with raw SNR. This is probability of error. And you can see, so the magic number in this millimeter wave is around minus 10 to minus 3 dB is where people think is the operational, uh, operationally interesting SNRs. And you can see that the error probability here was very, very bad, right? This is the best at the time. The second set of curves, these are interesting. These are uh, due to um, uh, high sum, um, um, at, at UIUC and Fadal Adib uh, and, uh, and I think Dina Katabi. Uh, they came up with a something like a random code. They were, random codes are uh, expensive to decode. So they were doing a hash based approximation. So this is the performance of random codes that basically randomly uh, create very weird shaped antenna patterns that will be equivalent to a random uh, binning, and then this is the algorithm. As you can see, depending on SNR, and this is we're doing it with different uh, 
be um, basically lobes. So with 5, 25, and 40, these are each one degree angles. And so you can see that it depends on the SNR. They could be very good or very uh, bad relative to each other, but roughly their performance is better than the adaptive search. So in some ways, the people in, the, in practice that were skeptical of adaptivity, they were skeptical because of this. Because the only thing people think of adaptivity is repeating, and repeating is going to be worse than randomly coding, right? So you can think of our algorithm as coding adaptively, and that's what you gain. The blue line, the light blue line, is the algorithm I described to you. It's the hierarchical posterior matching, but with a variable length stopping. So what does that mean is that you just go down the, the tree, and because this is going to be a random time you're going to spend in each node, you might get to the end of the tree later or sooner. On average, the, uh, the same as these, uh, after two milliseconds, this is the time of measurement for all of these, but in general, the average, you can violate that average quite a bit or you can stop earlier. So this is a variable length. It's not very practical. For practical reasons, you would want to say, I have this many number of this much time, decide, and that's, that's the algorithm you get, the blue curve. Uh, sorry, the green curve with the, uh, with the circles. The two are when you don't know the fading. So again, remember I told you that we don't know the fading. So what we do is we approximate the fading with some Gaussian measurements. If the error is too large, then you get a floor. Uh, so these are, these are sort of the algorithm. Um, I have a similar curve for the spectral. So here, to show you the, the interesting thing for the purposes of this talk is the following. Here I'm talking about probability of finding one degree angle. In reality, who cares about finding a one degree angle? I want to communicate. Right? So the really interesting question would be, you do all of these hard things, what rate can you communicate? And that's what this curve is really showing. This is the rate, bits per second per hertz, as a function of raw SNR. This is the communication rate. You find, you spend two milliseconds, you find the right angle, and then you communicate. And again, this is if you have no beam forming, if you just like, you know, basically omni, it's pretty useless. With SNR up to 10, you still can only do three bits or three and a half bits. Um, the, the blue is Al-Khatib, is, uh, is uh, Robert Heath's group. This is the binary search. If SNR gets larger than 10 dB, yes, they're doing great. They're at the capacity. This, the, this is the, sort of the, the optimal spec, uh, spectral efficiency. These are the random guys. This is our performance, it just hits uh, very well. And this is the fixed length one. This is the variable length one, it's not very practical. This is the practical version of it. There is another line I'm not showing you, which came out only after we thought about this problem from a practical perspective. I'm interested in maximizing my communication rate, so sometimes I use my two milliseconds and my posterior gets to three degrees width, but not one. I could make a bet and pick one of those three degrees as the target, or I could communicate with a slightly wider angle. Right? Slightly wider angle means my channel is worse, so if I communicate at a suboptimal rate, but I'm sure it's a correct angle. And that actually ends up being the best you could do. So the, in other words, you have a fixed, uh, instead of a fixed rate, B over delta, you keep delta as a random variable. You say, I'm going to tell you how much angle after I have taken my two millisecond of measurement. Right? So that's, um, that's the performance here. Now, we did the same thing. Yes. No, no, uh, yes, yes, yes. So you're doing your beam measurement. It's a game that you're playing with the beams. And then when you find the, uh, the, re uh, the transmitter, you will just fix at the best rate amongst all, at the best beam amongst them, and that's what you communicate. Yeah, that's a great question. That's how you get this performance. And that's why you might benefit from making the final beam a little bit less precise, but with more reliability. So that rate reliability uh, trade-off. 
Um, we did the same thing, and so this, the, the, the work I'm going to show you is the work we presented at IROS. This is the student who wanted to do computer vision and nothing else. So he indeed spent a lot of his thesis to actually build apps that are user-friendly. So the drone is, uh, actually this is literally our drone, it's a, uh, it's a Bebop Parrot drone, hundred. $20 or so, it's, it's a pretty uh, neat uh, toy if you like to hack. Uh, it has really nice, easy uh, interface in terms of SDKs and there is a whole community of uh, you know, enthusiasts who code these guys up. So he developed an app that basically uh, receives signals from the drone runs a convolutional neural net, a computer vision-based technique, to decide whether there is a ball in that target or not, and then analyze that to do the belief updates and so on and so forth that we like on the theory side. Based on that, autonomously decides where the drone should go in terms of the location of the search. A bunch of things that he, we had to uh, account for here is that, of course, the, you know, the region is not completely arbitrary. We had to do this hierarchical structure. The inspection regions were contiguous. Uh, there's many, many hidden parameters, just like the fading parameter is a hidden parameter. Here you have the, the, day, um, the light in the day mattered for our computer vision al algorithm. In a cloudy day, the color of the uh, ball is not as conspicuous as in a sunny day and so on and so forth. So we had to update those parameters during flight time, so you do this. Um, there is a asymmetric cost. So far I have said measurement is a measurement is a measurement. Here, if you're flying up, you use a lot more battery than you fly uh, horizontally or flying down. So we had to account for these things. So you can do a partial MDP and basic, oh, oh yeah, yeah. You see, I'm not a theoretician because I don't even, uh, a practitioner. So this is the drone, it's, uh, it's flying up. Uh, this is the drone on the, uh, on the side view, this is the ball, and it sort of gets this image. Even though the ball is there, it just doesn't actually de detect it correctly. You'll see that it will just uh, take a wrong turn, so it, when it goes down, it loses the ball it's in its field of view as it goes down. Every time you see the Cartesian um, uh, Coordinates here is the time when there is a communication and the drone uh, and the phone is updating the, the estimate. Now it makes a correction. Now it's found it, and you see. So it says find it, and then it just says next. Is there any question on this? Yeah. Oh, it did it right now. It just sits wow. next to it. No, no, so yes, you're right. So the right now, the information is the location of the ball. Okay. It, it goes up, it just stops. Yeah, as soon as it finds it and knows it, it, it just... Because I'm saying, like, if I find it, if it knows that the ball is, like, here, it might actually would be more informative to go check if the ball is not somewhere, you know, like some strange behavior. Like, yeah, it might do, it might do it. Right. We don't know. Yeah, yeah no, no. No, it still pretty much does a more or less hierarchical, but it has more inertia. So if you think of it as hierarchical, we'll go down the deepest point in the tree, that was the probability half. Now it doesn't go, it doesn't descend as fast. It's more conservative because it knows that going back up is cost. By the way, I should say, these hierarchical posterior matching is minutely different from the binary search repeated. Binary search has to make the decisions so precise, the first time it actually asks for half of the room, it has to repeat it to get the epsilon reliability. The posterior matching, the hierarchical posterior matching, says, ah, 50% good enough. At least 70%, ah, I'm good, right? So it's much more aggressive. Why, why can it be more aggressive? Is because it has a method of coming back up. So if I make a mistake and zoom in the wrong and I keep getting garbage, I keep realizing, ah, this was noise, I, I zoomed in too fast, I'm gonna go back up the tree. And that going back up the tree is the coding gain that you get. Okay, so that's it, even though it's, uh, it's uh, adaptive, it still has a non-zero coding rate.
So I've got uh, a few questions about the dynamic tracking uh, as well as decentralized hypothesis testing. So let's hope that I get enough time to talk about them. Um, so I apologize, I'll put it on hold because I would like to also talk about these more active learning setups for those of you who are more interested in machine learning. Then if there's time, I'll come back uh, talking about these guys. So. Um, um, what do I mean by active learning? <clears throat> so as I said, in classification in general, um, you basically you basically have, uh, and this is for uh, supervised learning, you basically have the input and the labels. And in classic setup, these are all given to you. So you have n samples of this start, uh, of this form. You have some models that uh, you're basically restricting your learning to. So think about a neural network, for example. And these models are parameterized. So by looking at these examples, you are learning the best parameter that explains the data. In the passive setup, this is given to you. Uh, and what people have noticed is that there is a lot of redundancy in, uh, in the data. So there is a lot of uh, samples that after a while are not very informative. So for example, in the uh, ben uh, benign versus malignant tumors, after a while you're not learning anything from a set of tumors, so you would like to um, sort of actively acquire. Uh, information. <clears throat> so basically, you would like to sort of orchestrate, and the simplest orchestration that you can do is which uh, samples you should ask for uh, for collection. This work that we did is all in collaboration with uh, Kamalika Chowdhury's work, and we dealt with two really important aspects of the data. One is imperfect labels, and the other one was sample selection bias. I'm going to give you the flavor of these, but I'm going to leave it and, and, uh, and uh, you know, for, for further questions if there is any. So in the imperfect labels, um, the, the real difficulty is what do you do with labelers that potentially can flip the label? What do you do if a labeler tells you a lot of I don't knows? So here, uh, this labeler and this labeler might have the same error rate in labeling, but one of them is careful. In, when it says I don't know, it says uh, it's telling you something about the examples, right? So there we were really, really interested in characterizing this difference between samples that are in error due to the labeler's hesitation, or in other words, we asked, do you gain information from the labelers that abstain, right? Versus labelers that are actually making errors, right? They flip the, flip the um, probability. And one thing we notice, and this is again for information theorists in, uh, in us, it's not surprising. When a labeler abstains, you can think of it as the label passing through a binary erasure channel. <laughs> Right? Erasures are much nicer quantities to deal with than flip probabilities. For example, with erasures, you can get perfectly decodability, right? Like detectability. You know when things have failed, right? You don't know, and you know you don't know. As opposed to the labels that are flipped, you don't know, but you don't also know that you don't know, right? So it's a much more difficult uh, the, uh, the problem. Now. At first, uh, we worked on, uh, on this problem at first from a uh, Bayesian setting. So this is the work that we did with Muhammad Nashwar in the Bayesian setting. So the setup was exactly like the active hypothesis testing setup. The only difference is that you were given a class of uh, models, let's say linear separators, um, I don't know, like threshold functions and so on and so forth. And you were asked to find the best parameter in that class. And we showed outer bounds and inner bounds and we uh, found for certain classes such as thresholds or linear separators, these bounds were tight. However, the really uh, sort of 
problematic uh, aspect that our approach didn't address, hence it showed up in information theory and not in a real machine learning venue, is that we assume that the noise models are given. This is very often the case with communication with information theory. We assume that if a labeler is flipping the data, we know something about how often they do it, and that's how we recover information, right? In the millimeter wave, I use the fact that I know larger areas are more noisy than smaller to decide how I actually do posterior updates. This posterior update really depends on you having a good sense for your noise model. In reality, in machine learning, you do not like to put models on such behavior, especially with labelers, right? There's a lot of mechanical Turks that are doing the labeling here. And maybe the guy is hungry, he makes more mistakes, later on he's well fed, he's got nothing else to do, he's making less mistakes. Maybe this guy leaves, his friend takes over the job, right? So really it's not reasonable to assume a model, it's not even reasonable reasonable to assume you learn that model, which is what they, all the practical solutions that I showed up, of course we didn't know the noise model for a computer vision based algorithm on a drone in a cloudy day, but we had enough time to learn it and adapt it. So we were adapting to the noise model even when we didn't know the noise model. Here, uh, the second piece of work, this appeared in NeurIPS in 2017, we basically did this uh, work with imperfect labelers, but now our algorithm was a universal algorithm. What does that mean? The algorithm was very similar in terms of the hierarchical structure, but what it did is that if the noise were well behaved, it got the best performance. If the noise was not be well behaved, it just, uh, you know, it just basically got uh, as, as good as the, uh, uh, the setup allowed it. So if you had a, no a labeler that was consistently giving you I don't knows that were correlated with the difficulty of the task or how close the, uh, the samples are to the boundary, to the decision boundary, then it learned that. It became more aggressive and learn that. If not, there were no patterns, it would just stay out. Right? What was the penalty we paid? The results in the previous work were truly asymptotic optimal in the information theoretic sense with the constants matching. The, the, the second results, orders were matching, right? So the constant, if you get log of V over delta, that's good enough for an order optimality. The constant in front of it was not the, the, uh, the goal. Uh, think about like just saying my, my the two uh, converse and the achievability general result I put in active hypothesis testing, I told you there is a gap. That gap is in the constant. The gap is not in the order. They were all order optimal solutions. So that's the price we paid. If there's any interest, I can, I can talk about this work uh, at the end of the talk. The second thing that we needed to worry about is sample selection bias. So here, we did active learning for a very different reason. So let's say uh, you're trying to learn the efficacy of a drug on patients, right? There is a lot of data that has been collected beforehand and is sitting somewhere that you can go and use that data to see what this uh, drug's efficacy is. But the challenge is the doctors who prescribe this data, they create a sample selection bias. They didn't give this drug completely randomly to their patients. They gave it to patients with certain characteristics, right? So if it's a medicine for, I don't know, certain kind of flu, maybe they gave it to people who had generally those symptoms. Maybe they all didn't have that flu, but they had the general symptoms that that. So there is a sample selection bias. Now, if you want to learn, if you want to use this data, you have to compensate for the selection criteria that the doctor picked because your, your samples are now biased. You can basically, the task is you would like to use active learning to compensate the sample selection of the original data set. So this is the very different in the sense that now our active, active, um, learning algorithm was not there to, re to uh, reduce the query complexity, it was there to compensate for something else in the data that was, uh, that was not possible. 
And we showed that if you have log data and you can do a little bit more in terms of actively collect a few samples, you can do a lot better than passively trying to learn. In passive setup, the trade-off between bias and variance is well known, and we showed that that trade-off gets a lot better. So this is, um, this is sort of more classic active learning. What I like to talk about, the second uh, uh, work that we did on, uh, on active interactive machine learning, I would say, is the idea of adaptive hyperparameter tuning. So this is the sort of, a, I would say, next generation of, uh, of learning. So ML models that these days are very popular, like deep learning and so on, they have two sets of, it's good to think of them as two sets of parameters. One set of parameters that are being learned during the training phase. Uh, this, these parameters are like you take the data and you're basically trying to find the model that describes this data, the, the parameters that describe the data the best, without um, overfitting. The second set of parameters are known, are referred to as hyperparameters. These are the parameters associated with your model. So let's say I say a deep neural network. How deep is it? Is it five layer? Is it 10 layer? How wide is it? How many neurons do I consider, right? So all of the, for nonlinearities, what kind of nonlinearity or activations do I use, right? These are what is called as hyperparameters. And they are tested on a much slower time scale. So the, the workflow for this sort of uh, learning is as follows. You, you learn your features, you learn your model, um, you know, and then you go in the world and just run it on, on data, right? So you put it implemented here, and this implementation is gonna work for a while. Then you come back, look at your data, untest that, say, is this a good example? Is this a good uh, architecture, for example? Is this a, um, you know, um, good non-linear uh, non activation, you know, like you, or maybe I should change it, maybe I should change the structure. So on a much slower time scale, you go ahead and change the parameters of these models, okay? And then you test it again, and then you go. Now, here, you can sort of think about this as a process of model improvement. I'm gonna put one little, um, what do you call it, plug for a new center that, I, uh, that I've started at UCSD. We call it Machine Integrated Computing and Security. And there this problem comes up over and over. And the idea appears in what is known as model customization. The idea is many, uh, many machine learning algorithms that are super popular, such as object detection, classification, so on and so forth, they are extremely computationally heavy. Right? So they're, they're designed to be run on the cloud. Now, every company in the world that I work with wants to do that much learning and that much training on your phones. More aggressively on the IoT device in your home, uh, on the IoT device in the street, in the corner, right? With very little battery, with very little compute. So a fundamental problem here is that you have a machine learning algorithm, you have learned it, now I have to decide how do I actually realize this in the hardware. So you decide if I'm putting it on CPU and GPU, how should I separate the operations? Should I take some layers and put them in my these GPUs and then another operation here or should I cut it across? There are a lot of questions you can ask to uh, to customize your algorithm to the hardware. And so far in engineering, we have gone in like these two almost like divorced, uh, you know, couples in the sense that the theory people, we have developed these sophisticated algorithms in which multiplication is free, uh, you know, I don't know, inner products are free, nonlinear operations are free. Why? Because I have CPU, you know, like really good GPUs and they can do everything. And 
If you ask someone like me what these operations mean, I really literally think you're going to write an integral and write a continuous variable. Like literally that's how I think and I teach my students by mistake to think that way. And then there is the other branch of the department, the computer engineers who come in, they know very little algorithms, but they have these fixed rules. They're like, oh, you know, multiplications, I should do this, right? So now if you want to uh, build a, a, a system that really takes an algorithm and puts it on your hardware. You will need a sort of a different view. You need to actually go back, change the algorithm, uh, put it on the device, see if it's going to work. If it doesn't work, then you have to come back and redo your algorithm. So the, the cycle of innovation is rather slow these days. Uh, a person who knows how to actually implement it often doesn't know much about what the algorithm's principles are, so they don't know what to do with, like if, if I have to cut back on compute, what computes are more essential than what others? And we are very bad at knowing you know, how this is done in hardware. So not only we need to change the model updates, even after the models have learned this customization, I would argue, is the same setup, okay? So the, what is the setup? The setup is what we call an empirical optimization. And this is what an, a, actually human beings do. You design a system, you run it in the world, if it works, you collect data about how well it works, and then you tune it. Right? So we would like in the center to do this in an automated fashion. Can we actually optimize things in an automated fashion? And this notion of active acquiring information now is actively acquiring sample space or examples that things are, are good. So this is, the, this is the sort of the setup. The customization uh, that I was talking about, this is a very um, caricature of a deep uh, neural net that you would like to customize it on your phone because I know I can't compute all of these and often there's a lot of redundancy in these networks. The goal is to get like let's say a very compressed version of this on your phone. And what you do is normally you hire a person who knows the hardware, hire a person who knows this and you ask them to work together to do this. And the techniques they use is they compress this network, for example, throw away a lot of zeros. They call it pruning, or these are weights that are multiplication. These are linear operation. You can quantize the weights with smaller number of bits, right? So you can do a lot of tricks here, and uh, people would just do this trick, put it here, try to make sense out of your hardware constraint, and do this. So this is the sort of the process. For example, this is the pruning rate. How many of these edges I'm going to throw away? So you can say 30%, 50%, 60%, 20%. You can just pick these percentages, build a network like this, and then you know run it uh, and see hope for the best. Or you could take these are eight width, uh, eight bit width computation. So when I say in our product, it's the eight bit. Uh, you know, approximations. Now, why eight? Why not six, two, three, eight? So these are examples I have uh, got from the literature where people have shown, oh, this is even working well. So I'm now multiplying numbers, but only for two bits, for three bits rather than eight bit representation. And as I said, when you look at how this is done and all the companies that talk to us, uh, they have a data scientist who knows, oh, there's redundancy in terms of the weights. I can throw away some date weights because I have played with it. And an engineer who can actually write, you know, basically program on, on GPUs and manages or profiles the hardware, well, how much power I have, what is the memory footprint, and you just put them all together, okay? And uh, it's time consuming, uh, super high cost. So, one of the questions is can we actually do machine learning on top of this, like intelligence on this, and, and this is what, uh, what we do. So a couple really simple tricks, right? So I want to turn, so this is now, I'm going to go in the mode of turning a real engineering problem that I thought was really hard into a math problem. Then I'm going to show you the math solution, uh, but, but this, is a, this is a good way to do this. So, yes. Is it really a, a, a 
Ah, so there is no guarantee. People showed, did, did it and showed it and it worked and then they wrote a paper in ISCA or ITCA or one of those computer engineering algorithms, right? Like you, you just uh, perform it and so the, the gold standard there is to run it on that compressed model, run it in real data, show that on CIFAR 10 or ImageNet you get accuracy of such and such. So the, Benchmark data sets. Yeah, actually, that's a good. That's a very good point. There is this. This field is really great because there are known benchmarks that if you do well, you're 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 accepted. Your solution is accepted. But the original work was so there was a work on quantization. There's work on pruning. There's work on decomposition. And because it takes a long time to experiment with these things, these papers are you know them themselves individually papers. So from a theory perspective. I thought, why don't we, for this, for this model, these are all like every, in every paper that we looked at, there are some per layer parameters. Why don't I create a long vector? This vector gets to be some vector, some vector V. And um, now this is the example, for example, like if you, they, the, the pruning rates is 30%, 50%, 60%, and so on. And the, the bit widths are from the paper I was mentioning, A211. These are all the quantities. I put them in this long, long vectors. And now the goal is to find the best vector. What do I mean by a best vector, right? The best vector should be what? Again, I'm using the language of the practitioner with the best score. And what was the score? Um, and what was the optimal? The score was some cooked up uh, objective function, which consisted on calculating power consumption, memory consumption, cost, whatnot, often run like just, just how many flops it has, how much compute you have, and accuracy. So you don't want to lose too much accuracy. So every paper had some notion of uh, cost or scoring, the optimality, which was a combination of these two things. Um, and then the problem for, from a theoretical perspective is I would like to explore the set uh, that the vectors come from to get the maximum score, right? So it's really a search problem. And I hope I've convinced you, you give me a search problem, I turn it into active hypothesis testing, right? So that's a, so like, can we actually do this? Now, what is important here, fast convergence, computationally efficient, and something I didn't talk about, and if I have uh, time at the end I will talk about, is parallelizable. I would like to find solutions that are, like if I have more hardware to do this, I can do it faster. So far, everything I have presented is a sequential. My drone was going one by one. It, it could not have five, uh, five eyes in different locations. But in reality, if you have a platform, you can actually make it parallelizable. So this is how, uh, and when, what, uh, this is how the, the basic structure works. Basically, you take, and this is, uh, this is today is what people um, operate. This is the, the um, you know, state of the art. You take all of your proper parameters, you customize your deep neural network or whatever machine learning algorithm that you have with these parameters. And then you put it on hardware and run it on test data sets and measure its performance. You run it on uh, test data sets and measure its inference accuracy. You create a customized notion of score function and you evaluate. Now, the, my first, uh, when I saw this, they actually, in fact, it was one, with uh, some students of my colleague Farinos and they were saying, oh, let's just use genetic algorithms. And if you are uh, somebody who went to grad school in the 90s, genetic algorithms are not most favorite, and you did information theory, genetic algorithms are not your favorite uh, objects of interest. So I got quickly, was like, why? Why are we doing genetic algorithms? And so the, 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 so I asked the students, uh, can we get an intuition about what the search space looks like? And this is what they showed. So for a really simple deep neural network of 18 layers, BGG uh, 16, uh, sorry, 16 layers, 
uh, it would take nine million years for them to run experiments to give me a sense about what the search space looks like, right? So in fact, I forced them, because I'm a theoretician, I forced them to do it for a two layer um, to get an intuition, and this is what we have. So this is two layer just for pruning. So then the X, uh, X1 and X2 are zero to 100% pruning rate, and what I'm showing you is some score function, which is the accuracy, some regularized accuracy plus power. Um, and and it, if you look at this, let me see if I can show you the, the shape of this function. This function is very ugly. It's non-convex. It's, uh, you know, its shape is, is weird. So, so the goal is to basically uh, assume maybe statistical properties here and try to find the maximizer or maybe other tricks. So that's what, uh, what the, uh, the, the really big question. Now these days I go to bed thinking about this problem, I wake up. So I'm gonna give you the first uh, solution we came up with. Uh, it's ongoing research. I'm really interested if you have any, any um, um, sort of um, insights or interest to, to work on this problem. It's, uh, it has nice connection to every branch of information theory signal processing that you can uh, think of. So what is the problem? So I hope I have convinced you that the caricature of the problem is the following. I have a function f that is not known to me in a closed form. I just know it's, it's, uh, you know, it's importance for me, <laughs> that it's the score function for me. And it takes some high dimensional variable x. Again, remember, this is the 16, dim 16 times three dimensions uh, that you can take. And it uh, gives me a real number. And the, as I said, I would like to optimize this function with the caveat that the closed form f is not known. Instead, it's actually, uh, you can think of it, because I'm gonna build it, run it on, uh, on the test data, and empirically measure it, you can sort of think about it as an oracle uh, with some noise. Right, so I can give x to the oracle, it will give me fx plus noise, okay? So I would like to maximize such function uh, by designing a sequence of queries, x1 to xn, to efficiently optimize f over a horizon f, okay? Is that clear? So I would like to do this, and uh, you, you know, um, you could have said, find the maximum uh, and then, you know, some neighborhood of the maximum would give me the smallest number of queries of the two problems. There are two performance measures you can, you can imagine. The first performance measure is called simple regret. After you have done your experiment, you compare how well you're doing to the best example you have so far found. And if this, small, this number is small, this is your being, having less regret compared to the person who had a closed form formula for f and could solve it for f of x star. So x star here is my optimizer, my maximizer. And sometimes uh, for in, in, in engineering, a more relevant notion of performance is what is called a cumulative regret. Imagine that I'm using these systems meanwhile that I'm optimizing them, right? So I have learned a model, it do, it, I want it to work while I'm actually experimenting. So your experiment has a double role. It is working, <laughs> so you don't want it to be giving you nonsensical answers, you don't want its accuracy to be really poorly, but it is used to you know, also teach you something about the next parameter set. So in that case, you would like to think about a cumulative regret, right? In, it, this is a little bit different from what information theory we're used to. In information theory, we learn something, and while we are learning it, we're not really using it, right? So we can do all sorts of informative action, right? Here, my actions have to be uh, sensible throughout the process. In this talk, even though this x in general can be a 
large um, and in, in our results it's like a generic vector space of you know general dimensions um, you know some kind of a norm space here for this talk please think of it as some subset of rd with the notion of norm euclidean norm okay for simplicity you can be fully generalized to any space that is metric and has nice uh, properties now this problem is ill-posed. If f is some delta function, like Dirac delta function, you know, spewed over a space, there is no hope I can learn its maximizer, right? I have to basically do the nine million year search and find them. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. So usually in these problems, you have to assume knowing f of x gives you some information about f of x prime. This could be a geometric relationship, and there are some papers that work with, let's assume f is some Lipschitz continuous function, maybe, uh, you know, other, other geometric properties. In my work, we, in the first step we took, we assume f is actually has some statistical model that it follows. In particular, we assume f is a sample stochastic process pulled from a Gaussian process. So F itself is a Gaussian process pulled out of a family of Gaussian uh, distribution. What do I know about this process? It's that for simplicity, this can be relaxed, that this process is zero mean. So there's, uh, there's no prior on where this, uh, you know, what the max maximum is. Uh, with some covariance function structure. So what does that mean? It says, if you give me x and x prime, I have a sense how correlated f of x and f of x prime are. And the observation model is also Gaussian. So this is known as the Gaussian process optimization, right? It's a Gaussian, everything is Gaussian. The nice thing about Gaussians is that when you make measurements, the prior is Gaussian, the posterior will remain Gaussian. So it's low complexity to estimate these functions in the following sense. So you will, you have a sort of a linear operation, almost linear, perfectly linear operation, looking at the past variables. You can estimate the mean uh, of the posterior, it's called posterior mean, as well as the posterior variance. Right? So at any time, so this is, this is a nice figure. So let's say the black is my real function, that is a Gaussian process that is pulled and it's not known to me. I have sampled and got answers that are described by these red crosses. After I've seen those samples, I do this linear operation, I get an estimate of the mean process and an estimate of the variance. So this is, uh, this is uh, the setup. Is the setup clear? Right? So this, this setup is now promising in the sense that now, because of this covariance structure, I should be able to learn something fast. Ooh. Ay, 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 and I forgot to bring my, uh, thank you. <laughs> I left it right next to the door so that I don't forget it, and of course it did. Okay, are there any questions about this? So is the setup clear? And this is the problem that Galen Reeve told me about. <laughs> so I was talking to him about active hypothesis testing and he told me, do you think you can formulate the, active the, the problem of finding the maximizer as an active hypothesis test? Uh, it's a partial answer that I, I, that I hope is, is uh, you know, interesting. And again, the example, the case study to have in mind is X is the set of the space of hyperparameters. Thank you so much. Um, F, F of theta, so here theta is the, the, uh, the, the hyperparameters of your classifier. F of theta is the performance and some test set. And you run a finite uh, N, N trials and find uh, theta N and you come up with the simple regret. 
when you look at this particular example, a very popular model of covariance. So now the name of the game is what is the covariance function? You have to define, you have to bestow on the problem a covariance structure on this problem. This covariance structure is often uh, very popular in this literature. It's called the matern uh, uh, family, uh, matern kernel fa uh, family. It's basically a parameterized relationship between f of x and f of x prime in an expected sense. So this is the covariance of f of uh, x and f of x prime. And um, the parameterized uh, version, it's almost like an exponential with these two parameters, nu and c. c is just a constant. So these new parameters are the important ones. The new parameters that are popular are half, three half, five over half, and so on and so forth. And they basically uh, classify how fast the covariance dies out with the distance, right? Because it's a function of the distance between the two, the norm of the two, uh, the norm distance, okay? So this is, so if I find a good algorithm, it should work well on these class of families, is, is what I'm saying. So here, let's, let's look at the prior work, yes. Oh, new here you mean? Yes, you're right. So that's that's always the problem with these uh, with these what is called meta learning when you, when you actually assume a Gaussian prior, then you have to decide what is the covariance, and then you have to learn that covariance. So people usually often use it on data and try to approximate it. You know, of course. You don't know, so that's what I'm saying is that from a, from a theory perspective, I'm just solving a Gaussian process optimization, but for practitioners, they have shown that this is a good approximation for functions that they have looked at. So the, the, the covariance dies out, it's not surprising, dies out with distance, so, so you have some geometry that is preserved, and how fast it dies out is more or less exponential in this. In this. But yeah, you're right, there's a lot of modeling question. And I will talk about, so there, there are a lot of interest to do this problem without these assumptions, in fact. That's, that's what we learn when we try to apply it to actually a real world. So let's, the, the prior work will give me a really good way to, to describe our, our approach and, and hopefully the connection to hypothesis testing. So the prior work does the following, you basically, so far, everybody is doing the same thing. You take the samples that you have collected and you build a posterior. Here, posterior would be Gaussian, mu t, and uh, sigma t are the only things. Now, all prior work goes like this. At time t, pick sample x of t that maximizes something called acquisition function alpha of x. And this alpha x could be anything that the designer wants, and this is actually, in fact, all from the literature. And this uh, alpha of x often balances exploration exploitation. It gives you a good sample to improve the chances that this is a, you know, this is a large value f of x. A, that's the exploitation, but it also gives you information about other points, okay? And these are the, some typical examples. So alpha of x is probability that f of x is greater than some tau for some tau, let's say 80% or something of, of what you have seen so far. Expected improvement is alpha of x is expected value that this function is above some t and integrate over all t. Uh, simplest one is this upper confidence interval, and I think uh, we'll, we'll work with this. It's basically alpha of x is mu t at x plus some regularized version of the variance, beta of n. So basically you calculate these functions, and as you can see, all of these functions are non-convex, and, and they have a lot of local ma maximums, right? So it's actually a kind of a nightmare to solve these problems often. But what people do is 
um, they say, okay, I'm gonna do a discretization. So I'm gonna discretize the space by some parameter, which is the, the length of the time that I'm gonna do. So let's say you're gonna take T samples, I'm gonna discretize the space as, you know, XT. And now instead of optimizing, truly optimizing, I'm gonna do a search in that discretized space, right? So of course, this is inherently gonna explode with dimension, right? Because discretization in advance will kill you because you have to discretize in every dimension and that's actually very expensive. There is another problem with the prior work, it's more on the analysis side. So the kind of results that they get, I'm showing you the cumulative regress bounds, uh, similarly for simple regress bounds, of, our, of, of the following form, that the regret is often bounded by some terms where this gamma of n shows up. This gamma of n is the, literally, is the maximum mutual information that any n points can provide about the function f. And now, if this gamma of n grows with number of samples, this regret bound grows uh, with that lambda of n, gamma of n. So, for example, for specific kernels, you can compute what this gamma of n looks like. So for maternal kernels, gamma of n's are exponential in n for nu's that are greater than half, and nu infinity, the double exponential, then uh, this is in fact uh, a, a log n to b, right? So these are uh, the behavior, and when you plug it here, it's bad news. The regret is, is not scaling so well with n. Right? And one thing we noticed is that, and this is really truly from thinking about the problem from an active hypothesis testing. If I'm thinking about the problem of maximization as hypothesis testing, my hypothesis is the location of the maximizer, right? Not the function itself. So if I just take blindly what I have done in active hypothesis testing, I was after maximizing the mutual information between my observations and my hypothesis. My hypothesis is the location of the maximizer and not the full shape of the function. And so this we saw that is inherently pessimistic for classes of functions that are really rich but not around their maximizer. In fact, we have these really like a machinery, you can, you can get into the habit of building these fractile style Gaussian processes. Here I'm showing you one. Uh, ignore the equation, it's much easier to explain. You take the interval, this is a one dimensional uh, example. You take the interval, break it into three pieces. The first piece, this last piece you leave uh, aside and put a simple cosine there. The second and the third piece, they get smaller cosines. The th one of the pieces you pick and you break it again to one third. So you create this fractal structure and every time you do these, you shrink the size of the function. So you're adding a lot of complexity to the function, but not to its maximizer. The maximizer is here, or if it was another cosine, it was here, right? If the sine is the only unknown, right? So in other words, it's easy to build examples with one sample. You can tell me exactly where the maximizer is, but the lambda of n can grow with n exponentially fast. Right? So, so what I'm going to uh, talk about, um, ah, time flies. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is is our work. So, I, and I'm uh, going to try to be. I understand that it's getting towards the end of the, uh, you know, the talk. It's not too late, but I'm, uh, I'm gonna try to be as uh, high level as possible. But please interrupt me if, uh, if it gets too technical and you need me to explain it a little bit more. So the first contribution is an algorithmic con uh, contribution. And there, I think it has the biggest connection to the previous work that I talked about in the sense that we basically do an adaptive discretization of the space and that allows us to have an algorithm that is actually low complexity in RD. 
So in other words, it grows only linearly with the dimension. Uh, in, uh, in, so that's the first one. And even further, if your f is a really simple function, like the one I showed up. It has a maximizer that is really simple. The algorithm will have even less complexity. So the complexity of the algorithm is going to be a random variable function of how lucky you were when you pulled that Gaussian process. If it was a very simple structure, you'll converge fast. If uh, you, you'll stop fast, your complexity is low. Otherwise, it's more complex. The second uh, contributions are analytic. So I'm going to show you regret bounds that are better than all known regret bounds for these Bayesian, uh, for this Gaussian process optimization, and show you, in fact, for the first time, we can get sublinear bounds for exponential kernel. So <coughs> the idea is to do a piecewise constant approximation to the function. So what does that mean? So I'm going to build an upper confidence on at any given time for where the function could be. Okay? This upper confidence consists on two bounds. One is the, my expectation about the value of the function at a point that I have evaluated, plus some sense of the variability of the function. So, and I'm going to do this adaptively in time. So this is a good uh, picture to start with. At the beginning, I take, this is my interval, I take two sub-intervals and come up with piecewise constant upper bounds on each of those upper bounds. These upper bounds are a function of the value of the function I have observed so far and the variability, so these are the covariances. And I have a sense, depending on the size, and the covariance structure, I have a sense how much variability I could potentially see in that interval. So if the interval is larger, my variability is larger. If the interval is smaller, my variability is smaller, right? And now my rule says pick the region with the maximum upper bound. It's a fixed value. Pick the, in, uh, the interior point, a middle point of this region, and sample it again. When I sample it again, I reduce the uncertainty of the noise that I measure at that particular location, right? I'm averaging that noise. And now I basically uh, reevaluate what this upper bound is relative to the side. Because I have made measurements, this guy at the middle point is going down and down and down. Now, <coughs> if I get to the point, and this is a good uh, picture, if I get a point that my uncertainty in the region, due to the size of the region, is comparable or larger than the uncertainty on the point, it's no, it's no use in sampling more in that point, right? Because that point will become more and more sure, but the region is so big that the uncertainty will grow in that region. It's not going to really improve anything. So if that happens, I break down the region that such an event has occurred. I break it into two pieces themselves, and I will uh, measure those, right? And I do this measurement, so these guys went down. I go back work with this one, break them down. So I'm, discrete, uh, I'm discretizing in an opportunistic manner when I have refined the uncertainty for region. So is the algorithm clear? Now I showed you in one dimension, then I will do this in D dimensions. So, and it won't grow more than linear with dimensions, because at every dimension, I, I, you can imagine I have a cube, I'll take this, the longest side of the cube and I break it into halves. And then when I'm done with this, I will pick the longest and I just do this. So it will grow only linearly in D, the complexity. Okay? So this is the, the structure. This is the tree-based structure. It comes, again, from this hierarchical posterior matching view. And it just says that if you have any general uh, metric space, you, that you can build such a tree, you can build this algorithm. So what is the properties of the tree? The tree, basically every node on the tree, uh, you associate two things with it, a region and a point in that region. 
think of this as an interval and the midpoint. It could be any, any other fixed structure. And as you go down this tree, you're going to cover more areas, right? So the cells of this, uh, the regions or the cells are going to be exhaustively covering each other, right? So if you can find, if you are in any metric space that satisfies these two conditions, our algorithm will work just like before. You will just go down the tree uh, that, that, that defines the space, okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so actually, in fact, I think more and more now that I have worked with people who are practicing this, uh, your data set, you pick it such that the, the noise, the, the additive noise is pretty much ignorable. Right? You're not too worried about that noise because that noise is also appears when you run it on the, te on the inference side. So, so we think of this algorithm in the noiseless setting, the same thing is true, right? So there's nothing specific about the noise. If you have less noise, you repeat less, but the, the other components are still less, right? That's a great question, yeah. So how does the algorithm play out with the fact that you said that it's a very similar thing? It's very similar, actually, it, it, it is, it's pair one, if, if you take all the low dimensional approximations, it's very similar. Right? It's, uh, it's basically identical. It's the Gaussian version of successive halfway, if you're familiar with that literature. Right? In, those, in that literature, they don't assume the Gaussian type. Right? So, of course, my algorithm will be more aggressive because I know something about the function that those, uh, those more practical ones don't assume. Yes? I'm, I'm doing one point at a time. I just remember the past points, right? So in that sense, I'm doing the same thing as successive halfway, but instead of many resources, I only have one. Okay. So they do a batch version. Your resolution is like your resource, like when you're narrowing down your resolution. Exit. Um, it's still with like halfway. The resolution and the halfway are identical, but I'm in the extreme case that I only have one resource, one sample. Right? So if, if you look at a longer shot, it's like you, you're taking one batch, and now my batch is even a larger vector. Right? From a batching perspective, it won't matter. It's just my dimensions have grown, and now I have, I have to do a larger number of dimensions. So that's why. Those are all great questions. Right. So those are, for those of you who are not familiar with this literature, these are algorithms that people are using on the real data sets. Here, as you can see, uh, I'm assuming a lot, so I, my algorithm can do a lot more, right? If I don't have the covariance structure, you, you'll be able to do. Now, <clears throat> ah, and to get, actually, to uh, maybe, where would I talk about? Ah, to get these results, this is a good place to talk about it. So let me just go back on this figure. To get the, the result I'm going to show you on the, on the regret of this uh, algorithm, as well as the complexity results, what happens is that even though, and this is the kind of the nuts and bolts of theoretical results that we have is the following. Even though when you pull a Gaussian process, you rethink of it, the only information we have about its geometry comes from the covariance function. It turns out, and this is really critical in all the results we have, is that if you pull a sample from a Gaussian process, with high probability that process is Lipschitz, okay? That's not surprising. It's going to be continuous. But more surprising, the Lipschitz constant is related to the covariance structure as well as that probability. So if you have less probability constraint, you can get a tighter Lipschitz property than others. So if you're saying, ah, oh, with 10%, what kind of uh, function I would get, you get pretty smooth functions, right? So, and that's really critical in what we're doing. It allows us to chain and use techniques that are really common in the geometric Lipschitz li uh, literature in the Gaussian literature. So that's why a lot of these things come come in hand. So 
again, the name of the game is I have to handle the variability in fairly large space, right? It's a d-dimensional cube. It's a very large. If I was just to use the covariance function, it will not give me a whole lot of results. But if I can actually chain them, then I can get really much tighter results, and the chaining comes from the geometry of the function, the Lipschitz geometry of the function. Okay. And so let, let me show you um, the, the uh, um, um, ah, is it right there? Ah, this is the algorithm, okay. So this is the precise algorithm. Let me, <laughs> I, I thought I covered this. Uh, now I, I am getting tired. <laughs> so as I said, so the, the algorithm is really talking about these cells that are re, uh, refining the space. And so um, at any round T, for the d dimensions, you're going to be at some partitioning of the space, L of t, and this is going to get, with time, get more and more refined, right? At the beginning, think of L of t consisting of two sets, and as you go down, it will be growing at the, uh, along the longest dimension of L of t, and then in d steps, you're growing, uh, you're shrinking in every side. So now this is, the, this is the name of the game, that you take a center of the cell and you're going to build this high probability bound on the value of the function in the whole cell. So how do you do that? You take an upper confidence interval, which is what we knew before, mu plus sigma, some uh, uh, regularized version of sigma, plus this variability in the set. And the variability depends on how far down the tree you are. If you're going down the tree, the cells are getting smaller and smaller. So if you are lower in the tree, the variability is smaller. And if you are higher in the tree, the variability is larger. This is the part of the, the technical uh, proof that really uses the Lipschitz structure of high probability Lipschitz structure. Now, if the variance in this upper bound is smaller than the upper, uh, the, the variability due to the size, then you expand the region. If the variance is large, you take more uh, measurements. So for the cases where the noise is negligible and you were asking me, then uh, basically this doesn't happen. You don't evaluate at the same point, right? Because it's not noisy after you have evaluated f of x of n, you know exactly it's that. The complexity, you do a bookkeeping, the complexity is really growing only linearly in D because of the structure of the tree, right? So the leaves of the tree are exponential in D, but uh, potentially you don't go down all the way to all levels. You basically have a tree that you have covered only uh, D, uh, you know, a linear uh, cut of it, okay? So you don't go all the way down. Uh, in terms of the regret, uh, the regret bounds are of the following form. It's a minimization of the previous bounds on what we call informational type bounds and the geometric bounds. And again, here is where we use the Lipschitz structure of the sample paths. And the geometric part is basically has a form N1 minus alpha uh, d plus 2 alpha, and this, sorry, d tilde. This d tilde is what I was telling you is the opportunistic number. So this says that the uh, regret is going to be upper bounded by a random variable, okay? The, it's a notion of the dimensionality around your maximizer. So if your maximizer sits in a low dimensional space, you can actually do your discretization allows you to actually get a better bound than if it's a complex maximizer that can be approached from any uh, direction. You can get a, a deterministic upper bound of D on D tilde. So this is basically uh, you have the upper bound when you replace uh, D tilde with D. Okay. Now. Sorry, this is for the regular regret, um, cumulative regret. This is, uh, comes directly from it. You get a simple regret bound like this. So 
uh, I'll show you how this actually is better for the matern kernel. Remember, this is a kernel that is relevant for us. This is basically showing the exponential kernel for different parameters. Uh, our bound is improved for all dimension larger than nu minus one. Nu was the parameter of the matern kernel. And I told you the relevant values are half, three, half, and five over half. So this is saying for dimensions greater than two, we have a strict improvement over known bounds. So um, when, when basically you're in RD and, and uh, the same. Ah, you can get for, for matern kernels, you can get it a little bit tighter. Remember I said D tilde is upper bounded by D. For matern kernels, you can show D tilde is upper bounded by three-fourths of D. So you can, you can get a free uh, improvement. Um, for the first time also, for nu equal half, which is the uh, exponential kernel, uh, we have the first sublinear showing that in fact, because this is the simpler structure, in fact, we do have a sublinear uh, regret bound for, uh, for um, this setup. And as I said, for nu equals three halves and five halves, for d greater than two, you have improvement. Uh, somebody asked me about the noiseless uh, case. So in the noiseless observation, uh, as I said, maybe more practical. So we looked at the noiseless operation and you can specialize the bounds. You get rid of the, the, you know, the worries about the measurement variance and you only are concerned now with the covariance structure and you get uh, uh, fairly good uh, bounds for, for this set of regret. Now, if anybody is familiar with the literature on the noiseless Gaussian process, uh, our algorithm, basically the only other algorithm with this sort of um, uh, adaptive discretization. The adaptive discretization allowed the complexity of my algorithm to be linear in D. Every other algorithm was exponential in D. The only other algorithm that is in the Gaussian process literature we know of is, uh, is BAMSU, is an algorithm. Uh, and in, again, that one is adaptive, so this, uh, this uh, it's scalable with dimension. It's the only algorithm in the Gaussian literature. And our algorithm uh, has some advantage over that. So first of all, uh, our algorithm uh, in terms of regret bounds is better than the, uh, the analysis of BAMSU's algorithm. So in, um, in other words, uh, if, uh, if you look at the regret analysis for matern nu equal to half, uh, you, the, the analysis in the literature is not available on BAMSU and we give a, sort of a, a corollary uh, analysis. And our, uh, our regrets are also strictly tighter. This does not mean that the algorithm is better. It just means our analysis is tighter uh, as far as we can say. We have not been able to adapt our proof uh, to analyze this algorithm because of the geometric structure that we were using. Okay, so how are we doing? Are there any questions on what I covered? No? Great. Okay, so then if that's the case, I'll just go back and talk about a question that, that came up in the, um, uh, in the first break, uh, or the second break, uh, around uh, dynamic uh, tracking. So um, we try to take the same idea and apply it to a moving object. What I'm gonna show you is uh, a simple moving object in some sense and a very difficult one in another sense. So I'm gonna assume that the movement of my object is deterministic. So the object is gonna run away with a deterministic factor, but a multiplicative deterministic factor. So in other words, theta of t, you can sort of think about it, and this, is, uh, this happens when you, for example, stabilize an inverted pendulum. 
okay? The angle of the pendulum will be perturbed as alpha times t, alpha of theta t, so theta t is the angle and then it's just going to be alpha version of t. And then I said it's really simple because it's deterministic. We're just going to shift the, the, the position. But at the same time, it's hard because alpha is greater than 1, is strictly greater than 1, right? So what does that mean is that it's basically blowing up, right? Of course, this is not going to blow up to infinity. It's around the time where you really want to stabilize it. This is going to fall, <laughs> right? But the approximation is that you don't want to lose this object, right? So I'm assuming that I'm controlling an unstable system, like an inverted pendulum, but I'm doing it with measurements from a remote uh, uh, setup. So I basically have the same setup. I'm looking at a region. If the object is there or not, I get an indicator, and it's perturbed by a channel. And now I estimate it, and I correct it. Now, because I need to correct it, that's where things are tight. So if I, if I knew exact, if everything was perfect, if I had no uncertainty about theta, I would correct it by pulling it back to zero, right? Which is the location I want, so where I have normalized it. But now you can see if I have any little error in theta t minus 1, it's going to grow to twice, let's say, let's say if it's alpha is 2, to twice, next step, four times next step, and so on and so forth. So you really need a very good estimation of theta of t. Okay? So you would like to send theta of t to 0, and, and this is my control objective. To be able to do this, I need to, so again, I need to estimate the initial location, theta zero, exponentially well as time goes on, right? Is that clear? Because if I make, let's say if I do an epsilon error here at time zero, I have an alpha times t that will be multiplied. Right? So unless this guy is going to zero exponentially fast for all times, I cannot stabilize the system. Right? So first thing first, so you remember for active hypothesis testing, I gave you a rate reliability analysis. This is a far more reliability than the reliability I gave you there. There I said after some measurements and measurements, you want an error to die out exponentially. This one says, I want this error to be going to zero continuously forever in a horizon-free manner, right? It's not like I can make a measurement, be done with it. I have to measure forever, okay? So this, this notion is now called an anytime reliability. I need it to be valid for all time. And I need it to be done in a horizon-free manner. So in other words, just uh, a summary, I need a slightly stronger notion of reliability than what I showed you before. So for mobility, if you have side information that says your mobility is out of, uh, under control, then don't worry about it. You can take the methods we had before and do a combination of posterior and, and follow-up. But if it's unstable like this, if the system is running away, then you need stronger notions of reliability, okay? And the question was, can we gather, uh, get this kind of notion of reliability? And the answer is, um, you know, depends on the, on the setup. But for binary symmetric channel, I will show you that, yes, this is the case. So this is the, uh, here I'm showing you P, the, pro uh, the crossover probability, sorry the crossover probability. So I'm going to assume this channel is a binary symmetric channel and with the crossover probability P. And I'm going to show you what kind of alphas I can handle, how unstable I can handle my system based on how much noise I have here, right? So this is a sensible question in the sense that if this guy is blowing up 
really fast. My uncertainty is blowing up too fast. My channel might not, my channel is a one bit channel. At any given time, at best, it's giving me one bit. So I can't really hope to get any results, right? So this is the curve, this is the upper bound. On what is the alpha? The best alpha I could hope for is when I have no noise. I get one bit for every measurement, so I can handle blowing up of the uncertainty by a factor two, right? Is that clear where that comes from? Now, as P grows, I have to cut back on how much alpha I can tolerate, okay? So this result is not, is not due to me. This is uh, the, the work of uh, previous authors. In particular, the way I am presenting it uh, is the closest to Alan Sahai's thesis on the maximum uncertainty you can handle over a channel for any time reliability, okay? So this is, uh, this is the setup. Now, we would like to understand, can we get close to here? And right now in, in, in the literature, there was no notion of how close you can get to this except for a sort of a existence result. Based on a tree codes, we don't know how to construct them, we don't know how to decode them, but there exist codes that achieve this, but that's about it, okay? So the, the um, schemes were not known. So this is the, the posterior matching scheme that we came up with. And basically what it does, it uh, combines what we have seen before, which is find the posterior. So now noise is independent of the measurements, right? Now here the noise is just a simple flip probability. So you first, let's say you are uncertain about the initial location. I'm gonna convince, uh, because of the model, I hope you're all convinced. All I have to do is estimate theta zero at time zero and then feed forward it with alpha t to get the estimate now, right? So the posterior on the theta zero is all I need to keep track of, right? Is that clear? So we're gonna start at time zero with a uniform location on minus half to a half. Okay, and now what we will do is that we will do similar to posterior matching. So for every time t, I'm gonna find the median of this, pri uh, of this posterior now, and I will search the left of it, or right of it, doesn't really matter, right? So you will search left of the median at any given time, okay? Now this is after you have, you know, you have a, posterior and you do that. Now, you observe y of t, you use the Bayes rule to write a half step posterior, which is without counting for measurements, let's make the observations, uh, the make a posterior of theta zero observed, so, and what you have observed using y of t. So you're gonna make this measurement, and now this, of course, has both the prior in it, this guy, as well as the mobility, right? So that means that you're gonna take um, the location uh, and then use the location, the, the estimate of the location, to be the median, right? And use that estimate to do your control, right? Here. I'm, I'm interested in controlling. I, I don't care about estimating except for this. So this is, this is how it works. So this is the posterior matching strategy. I have theta is between minus half to half. The median, uh, I'm gonna estimate theta to be zero. This blue is, is the true theta. So you start, you make a measurement, and then you half this, and you have this. So in other words, you are subtracting the effect of the movement from your measurements, right? So as time goes by, your posterior on the initial theta zero is shrinking, right? Now, if I take this posterior, multiply it by alpha t, I get a much fatter posterior, right? That's my posterior about time that I am in, where theta zero is, but the posterior about actual theta zero, the initial condition, shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. Now, we could analyze, um, uh, we could, sorry, empirically simulate our algorithm. So here is I'm doing empirically uh, I'm um, 
are running this uh, experiment of searching over a binary uh, symmetric channel, and I'm using the posterior match to estimate theta zero, feet forward, estimate theta hat at time t, subtract it, do the stabilization, see if it stabilizes or not. And this is the kind of alphas that we can see it stabilizes. So there is a gap. However, the good news is no matter what crossover probability P I have, I still can handle some exponents, some uh, unstable system. So this is the first result where we have a constructive coding scheme that for all P's ensures that I can handle um, the, the, um, the performance. Um, this is the, uh, as I was saying, the, the best we could do is look at some random code structures, uh, and random tree codes. Uh, we don't know how to decode them, but if we did, this is how they will perform. Right? And so this is, uh, you know, just the existence, it's not construction. There is a work by Shimshak, uh, Jane, and Varaya where they actually come up with an algorithm very much like binary search. They do bit by bit and use the bit by bit reconstruction to go back, estimate the theta star and uh, feeds forward, similar to ours. Think of this as a binary search with repeats. And they can show, and when you simulate it, they can handle smaller probabilities in the channel, but as soon as you become larger than 0 0.06 or 7, actually, even empirically, they cannot uh, improve. <clears throat> now, in terms of an, our analysis, our analysis is also guarantees you can stabilize some alphas, but the alphas that we stabilize are a lot worse than the alphas that actually empirically we ourselves can show. So the, there's a huge gap, again, in terms of reliability. Um, the, the other green line is the analysis of Shimshik et al. So you could go back and really um, basically sew the two proofs to get an improved achievability bound of these two schemes in terms of the rates that they can. Now here, again, when you go to the more general setups, I hope it's consistent with the story I told you at the beginning, that for general active hypothesis testing, the outer bounds and what you can achieve are fairly, there is a fairly, uh, you know, uh, sort of a missing analysis in terms of what kind of analysis uh, they do. Uh, perfect. So. Are there any questions? Wow, six minutes. I don't have time to do much. Any questions? Okay, I was too optimistic. I thought I could cover one more thing, but maybe I'll stop here. So, just do a shameless advertisement. <laughs> so in my group, ever since I've started this, uh, this work, uh, we have taken some of these theoretical ideas and have come up with this platform of drones that we use them for a very different set of uh, applications. Uh, my favorite one is uh, we are working with a rancher to use the drones to help them with their ranching operation. We count the cows, we find the cows, the missing ones, we find uh, issues with their fence. All the, instead of the ball, remove the ball and put a cow and you get all of the videos I showed you. Um, you can, gener in general, for these wide area object tracking and searches, this, the, this, these kind of platforms are interesting. I didn't get a chance to talk about the distributed hypothesis testing work that we are doing. So now you can sort of think about each of the drones are covering different areas and they would communicate to each other what they have learned or to a platform and that platform is making decisions about the locations. So we're doing a lot of things for, uh, for wide area. Um, and then, we have, so the drones I showed you, they're this size. These are outdoor drones. They have GPS. They're very good. They can 
give us a lot of information. We have some really silly little drones. Uh, I love them. I think of them as Tinkerbell drones. They are like this big, fifty dollars, and they they and they have a uh, sort of a little cage around them. So if they hit things, that they don't you know break their um, their blades or anything. And uh, and my sort of ideal, and we are very far from it, is that this drone just follows. And my aunt was telling me that when she goes shopping, she can't check the products on the lower shelf, and I promise that I will have a Tinkerbell drone that will take a picture of those. <laughs> but basically, we're commanding them with, uh, you know, words, where to go and what to do, and they do really simple tasks like find your keys behind the couch and things like that. So with that, oops, uh, I guess with that, I'll just stop here. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you that this set of problems in, uh, uh, in, um, and the intersection, I would say, of active machine learning and information theory, signal processing, these are all very um, great, many theoretical questions. And fortunately, still the practitioners are a little bit lost at what to do, so they still listen to us if we come up with good enough of a solution. And um, and with that, I'll take questions if there are any. Let me stop here. Any questions? <laughs> well, maybe we don't have any questions. We have a microphone, but no question. <laughs> questions for the microphone or for uh, the Yeah, maybe the sound of that is enticing enough questions. Maybe one question is too much to ask for, but what about if we ask for two questions? <laughs> Yeah, you have to ask two or more. If you ask a question, you guarantee someone else will ask. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it surprises me. Nobody asked me if we ever used our Gaussian process on the real data sets and whether. So since nobody uh, asked, I'm not uh, going to give you the use answer. Your, <laughs> have you use this on real data sets? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to give you the answer. Okay. <laughs> but the, 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 the long answer, I'm not going to give you the short answer, the long answer is that um, basically there's a lot to do, a lot to do in, in that space, yeah. So uh, the, the Gaussian process, it's, it's promising, but might not be the only way to do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm a I'm a implementation guy, so I'm uh, more interested in how to implement these algorithms. Uh -huh. so you didn't mention anything about trade-offs uh, of your of this algorithm ver versus the, you know, the let's say mainstream algorithms. Okay, trade-offs in the sense of the metrics that you mentioned for performance, like memory, power, number of gates, uh -huh. and all that stuff. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And for the for the optimization for yeah. the empirical optimization yes. one. and uh -huh. even. And even, uh, and even the time of convergence or the speed of convergence, okay? Yep. Because this uh, is very important in real, ta real time application. Okay? So, so I'll tell you, uh, we have looked at, so there are two answers to your question. For the empirical optimization pay, uh, work, for, and I give you a sort of a very different answer for the, for um, the search problem. But for the empirical optimization work right now, my understanding is that having worked with this, there are two types of solutions you can give based on the theory. One is to learn the insights from the theory and come up with generic rules, such as successive halving, right? Like such as, um, you know, you can improve on known results like known algorithms come up with similar algorithms in the sense that our algorithm here just said take the space and refine it in, a, in this fashion and now maybe not half it, maybe three fourths, maybe two, you know, a half. Like that's the sort of the variations that it can suggest. 
or you can use data to build models as you go. Unfortunately, in the empirical optimization world, you do not have that much data to build a lot of a lot of knowledge. So when you do that, you get in this sort of reinforcement learning version of the problem. But honest to God, I don't think you have enough information to really learn a whole lot more than just using the more, uh, the sort of the insights and just let go of the models, right? So the model, in, the model improves your search but not by enough for you to spend time learning too much of it. That's, that's my sort of short answer on the empirical one. On the, on the tracking one, the answer is very different because the physics of it we know, right? So there we can precisely tell you how much improvement you get and then it's up to you whether the complexity cost is worth the improvement that you give. So for example, for the angle of arrival, the performance improvements are not much, but if you're doing a search like the, the drone one, I can give you unbounded improvement, right? Because it's a question of how much noise you're collecting and I can really ensure that you don't waste your time on really big noisy setups, right? It's like a coding, uh, you know, uh, improvement and it's very worth it. So it really depends on the application. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there was a figure you showed, the two-dimensional optimization, which you said it's non-convex. So you had two features, right? Mm -hmm. One was the, the number of neurons in the first layer, the other one. Yeah, percentage of the right. uh, of links that you dropped. So assume you fixed one, you fixed the number of uh, neurons in the first layer. Mm -hmm. How could this thing be non-convex? I mean, there should be like a trade-off, right? If you Remember have too many, uh, too, too, too little neurons, it's like the accuracy would be too low and you know, vice versa if it's too large. So oh, because like it's not only accuracy, it's also power. But I mean, the power also should have some like monotonic relation, right? Uh, yeah, but not necessarily, you know, not, it doesn't have to be that you take a con two concave function and subtract them, you don't, you might not get a concave or convex, right? right. It right. depends, so that's, that's, that you, you just answered your own question. Right, but, but maybe by modeling them like, the, you know, each, then you can solve the easier optimization problem. Because you don't each. Yeah, you could, you could always like say, oh, I have some convex, you know, approximation, I'm gonna solve that. I, you can do per dimension solutions and then solve the per dimensions. You can always do that, right? But the interesting question is, will they perform very well? And they won't. In this case, if you do single, so a lot of people have done, fix everything else, optimize one parameters, single everything else, you lose the information, which was if it actually, if I go back to that figure, it does a good job of showing you. So if you magically know which surface to look at, mm -hmm. yeah, let me just, Yeah, if you look at this, if I know that the dependency of these two are along this line, yes, there is a hope then, then op I optimize. But if I just do one at a time, I miss the topology of the, the dependence of the two things. In fact, that's how regularly people build intuition. They pick a couple and they try to find the parameters that are most related to each other and then optimize across both of them at the same time, right? So that's the trick. A lot of intuition comes from how are they dependent on each other. Maybe there are a few of them that are order of magnitude better than the other one. And I am arguing that by looking, by trying it, I should be able to recover that structure, right, in some ways, maybe assume this function is not too crazy, like maybe only seven parameters are involved at any ver uh, of any function, and then you have a sparse argument to make, like maybe the function is sparse in some domain and, and the polynomials that are, then yeah, you can, you can really improve. And I would be very interested in those solutions. 
But if you just take a simple view that like, oh, it's convex or it's a couple parameters, unfortunately, it's not. Yes, go ahead. I have a question about the application side. It seems like most of your work, when you're doing the implementation, you're dealing with drones. Why drones? It seems they're like cheap, and my students love them. And but they seem like, <laughs> in a lot of cases, like that's kind of fitting a square peg in a round hole. Like they might not be the best application for things like assisted living, the livestock monitoring. There are cheaper and easier solutions using different modalities. So actually, on the on the on those two applications, I haven't seen much difference. So, so the only thing would be short of, I don't know, satellite imaging or something. Like counting cows from any other angle is very hard. On the top, when you fly them, they're immensely easier, right? Because you get like... Did you get that on the, on the taller instrument there? So this is the interesting thing. The GPS, you have to read it. If, if it's high power that you, you can read it off of a really big device, yes. But the, the stuff that my, the, the, um, the guy who works with me has, they are RFID level. So you have to get really close to them to read it. And this is much, it, this is much farther. So I have the videos I can show you. This is around 25 to 50 feet away. And it doesn't disturb them, doesn't mess up with them. And so, so the counting is really a, an application that swear to God, the, the guy who has the calves would tell me. And at the end of the day, he's pulling them in and he's really struggling because you're on a truck counting cows. He was telling me every single time. So he's him, him and his wife and they always get it wrong. Right? I mean, it's normal. Like, you go try count cars in the street. We will. We are not good counters, right? As human beings, right? So, so I uh, on the on the outside ones, I actually like the inside. You're right. I mean, maybe there are other ways of like maybe it's, uh, alarms and so on and so forth. I just like it because it's cheap and it, why not? Why not? You know what? What other? What? What? What thing better than Tinkerbell, right? Like it's uh, perfect. That's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a go cool technology to have, and I think it should be able to do that. I mean, yeah, you're right. Maybe there are, like, maybe, th and sometimes I think there are not even technological questions. Maybe there should be more caregivers than paid at higher rates, right? <laughs> I'm not trying to say that this uh, technology will fit, but it's a really intriguing question. Why not using it, right? Because the house is the same. It will always be the same location. You know, you need very little information, and these things are very agile, right? Compared to the old-fashioned robots, and they're easy to to program. Yeah, so some of it is also that that fact. And you should understand, I never had students who want to do summer internship with me at an undergraduate level because I was a theory person who wanted to prove equations. Now I have drones. I have a lot of undergrads in my lab. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I just wanted to ask um, that the, the problem of adjusting the hyperparameters of those models you talked about, it seems to me that maybe it's more close to a constraint version, like optimization problem. But I, I see that your work is like more in an unconstrained like approach. Is there any extension you thought about like to extending to this? Oh, uh, so I, I, yeah. So it looks like unconstrained because everything is regularized in that sense. But you're right. I it, it was a really a constrained problem that I have taken the constraint and brought them in, in terms of penalty terms. Okay. I just used the, what is the practitioner's the kind of like common thing they do. They don't like to solve an optimization problem, much less to do a constrained version. So they usually play with the score functions and get some, some penalty terms that works for them. That's why we did it. But you're right. I mean, you could, you could do a con constrained version of it. It's very interesting. Thank you.